environment and they draw uh, upon their social cognitive abilities uh, and learners are able or children are able to actually acquire or extract linguistic knowledge from the input they receive and generally sort of acquire uh, the rules of the respective languages. And humans are exquisitely adept at uh, finding patterns in language. So um, that is something um, that we are really good at, uh, not just finding patterns in language, but in general, uh, finding patterns. And uh, from a usage-based perspective, we assume that um, this sort of input that looks maybe uh, to some people really, really chaotic is actually very um, pattern-like and that we are very repetitive and uh, we are often repeating ourselves. And um, that's what studies on child-directed speech, for example, have shown that uh, we have a lot of uh, carrier phrases that we are using, we're repeating ourselves, and that's sort of the gateway to growing productivity. And that actually helps children um, to extract um, the linguistic knowledge um, from it. Um, so um, we know from research that um, the patterns uh, in child-directed speech are significant predictors uh, um, of the patterns used by children. So we know that for uh, certain speech errors, for example, for lex uh, lexical frequencies. Um, we also see that for multi-word chunks. So we have this um, actually relation between the patterns that parents use in their language. Those are the ones that we actually also see uh, in the kids um, acquired fairly early on. So children are able to extract linguistic knowledge from the input and the input is particularly sort of um, tailored towards this um, uh, pattern-like nature. So they, uh, in a piecemeal way, extract the knowledge and uh, gradually build up um, their complexity. So um, the piecemeal acquisition, that is what uh, Tomasello in a way sort of outlined in that we have, first we start with uh, individual words, um, fixed chunks, then we have early word combinations, we have pivot schemas, and then gradually sort of expand uh, complexity. Um, and a lot of our language, uh, and not just kids' language, but also our language is a very pattern-like. So we have a lot of frame and slot patterns that we're actually using where we have a fixed sort of um, lexical um, pattern, and then we have an open slot into which we always insert and slot in new items. So um, the question, of course, is, um, I mean, I've talked about a lot of patterns and um, how can we actually extract patterns? Um, there are several methods available and we've actually now used all of them. Um, so um, it's interesting how the script changes in a way. <laughs> it's so, so, um, okay. So the trace like method uh, actually works in that way that you take an utterance and then you try to derive the parts of the utterance from early utterances before. Um, uh, the chunk-based learner works um, with backward transitional probabilities and based on uh, these transitional probabilities, um, um, uh, it detects chunks in uh, the, the child language or uh, any whatever corpus you feed it with. Uh, dynamic network model is what we're talking about today, um, and that one works with uh, word frequencies and actually the, uh, how often sort of um, when words occur together, then the strength, uh, the link between these words and the frequency builder, uh, we're just working on that, is actually concerned with over and under representation of items in, in originally application, child-directed speech. Now we also use it um, in um, the kids' data, actually. So um, for today, um, we'll talk about um, the dynamic network model and the network dynamic network model actually um, works in that way that it, or it boils down to a combination of two measures. So we are talking about word frequencies and transitional probabilities and um, the network um, boil, uh, builds up patterns of use based on distributional inf information. So in that way, it basically simulates um, cognitive processes so like the language itself, it is blind uh, to grammatical information and um, um, uh, in that way, it builds up um, patterns of use. So how does that work? Um, let's just assume um, we have these two utterances here. I want cake and I want milk. And the way the model works, it parses these utterances into bigrams. So first we have I want, and it occurs, uh, so these are the first occurrences, and we have sort of a first sort of in a way link between I want 
And then we have want cake. So here the links are sort of pretty much the same because uh, it occurs for the first time. And then we have I want milk as the next utterance. So the link between I want is strengthened because it encounters the same um, occurrence or sequence again. And then uh, the link between uh, want and cake um, is um, similar, although want uh, occurs um, again. And what happens when you sort of feed or the model with it, um, however you call it, um, it detects um, these repeated um, occurrences of words, sequences of words, and um, it the weights between these repeated connections uh, or the weight increases actually between these um, um, connections. So in that way, it uh, builds up um, yeah, a network of the whole language you feed it with. And, you know, we could do the same like this now. So we have, I want milk and then I want cake. So the link again between I want is strengthened. Then we have the cake is yummy, for example. So it adds the note there. And then we have a link to cake here in this case. And then um, the cake is gone. Um, so um, we have these um, sort of repeated um, um, yeah, sequences of words and the link between these is strengthened. And in that way, um, the model actually encounters certain hubs, so certain communities of words that co-occur very frequently, frequently together. So um, we did this um, with... Um, German English bilingual children. So we try to build a network of um, corpora of German English bilingual children. And um, we used, um, yeah, Sylvie and Fion. And these are two children that have been recorded a long time ago. Uh, they all grew up, uh, they all grew up in a so-called Opal uh, household. So one parent, one language. They had um, a German speaking parent and an English speaking parent. Um, although this is sort of similar between these kids, um, uh, what is interesting is that Sylvie, for example, would be considered a more or less uh, German proficient child because it was just her mom who was an English speaker, so only one interlocutor in Eng uh, for English, whereas Fian actually um, was initially German proficient, more German proficient, but then parents were in a way um, unsatisfied with the input situation and they increased the English input, and we actually see this shift of increase um, throughout the recordings. And now. Okay. So now we move on to um, the results. So uh, first of all, I will have to explain a little bit um, how the communities are actually detected because um, the idea behind this dynamic network model is that we take um, these networks that are compiled in the way as antitrust described and then we try to find um, communities in these networks. So that was um, the basic idea in the original application by Paul Ibbotson and colleagues. So um, the argument was that um, when investigating child-directed speech, which they did, um, the things that make child-directed or that make language learnable um, and that are represented in child-directed speech are basically two things that are connected with each other. On the one hand, that child-directed speech is uh, characterized by what is called um, small world properties in um, network science. And small world, world properties means that um, you have very short pathways from any node in the network to any other node in the network. And on the other hand, and basically to some extent counter to these small world properties, um, there's also the, phenom the phenomenon that you have clear hubs within this network. So you have um, kind of communities where you have very dense connections and um, the argument by Ibbotson and colleagues is that it is these um, hubs that contribute to make language learnable because they provide uh, children with basically an anchor um, for learning language. And that's particularly clear when we take a look into these hubs that they identified because we find um, recurrent patterns. So they also look at the um, parts of speech that we see in these um, communities and they showed that when we investigate these parts of speech combinations um, then we see that these um, clusters kind of provide a very clear 
anchor into um, this who did what to whom um, syntax of everyday language. And we thought um, it would be interesting to apply the same basic method to these bilingual data and also to the child data to see, uh, first of all, if we can replicate the basic results for the child-directed speech data. And on the other hand, to see um, if we can also detect similar communities in uh, the children's data and particularly in the children's code mix data. Um, and our idea was, or our expectation was that if we apply this to the children's data, we would probably um, also find these hubs, these communities, and basically a, cent a center of these hubs, we would find um, what is called uh, so-called pivots by Tomasello and others. So um, basically these, uh, single words around which uh, lots of um, other words are kind of arranged and that serve as, uh, yeah, basically also hubs um, for language development. Um, and uh, examples for these pivots would be things like more in very early speech, so things like more milk, more uh, yogurt, more whatever. Um, where we have these typical two word utterances that become more sophisticated over time, where we then get um, these more complex um, frame and slot patterns like what are you X or what are you Xing that are kind of abstracted away from many different instances like what are you eating, what are you playing, what are you reading, and so on. Um, and this is also what you can detect using these uh, methods. And now the question is how do we get uh, to these? Um, clusters. Um, so basically what the method does is um, that it tries to detect communities from the data by taking a look at um, the co-occurrence probabilities of the individual nodes. So each word would be a node and because we're working with bigrams, they are kind of, uh, they are connected and these uh, connections have different uh, strengths. So um, in network terminology, we call these uh, individual words uh, nodes, and the links between the nodes are called edges, and the strength of the connections between the nodes is called uh, the edge weight. And um, from these different parameters, so the frequency of the individual words and uh, their co-occurrence probability as uh, represented by the edge weight, um, an algorithm just takes uh, basically every word and puts it into a community. So starting uh, first of all by kind of assigning one community to every single word. Uh, so we basically start with isolated nodes and um, then it kind of tries out what happens when we um, pair this node with each other node and then um, basically checks which one uh, to which one is it, uh, it's closest in terms of uh, proximity in the network and other factors like edge weight and so on. And then it, um, uh, it basically uh, checks which of these options is the best one and this is our first community and that's repeated for every node in the network until we have a limited set um, of networks. This method is uh, called the Louvain method uh, named after the place where it was uh, developed and from uh, I don't Ah, I'm in yeah, the wrong direction, sorry. <laughs> so uh, yes, not very iconic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, I'm still going back, right? No, yeah, um, no, I'm actually, I was actually going in the right direction. So, uh, but uh, the presentation is going in the right direction. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, okay, apparently uh, that was in the, in the presentation twice. Um, so what, uh, so here we see again the individual steps. So we kind of break down the child data into bigrams, then we, 
um, construct a network from transitional probabilities between each two words. And then we use this method that I've just uh, explained in very complicated terms. In fact, it's uh, probably a bit easier. And we use uh, Gephi to visualize uh, the data. And uh, here are the results for the child-directed speech data. Um, it's, of course, hard uh, to see any patterns in there, as good as we are in pattern detection, but uh, let's still try. Um, so one thing that is very obvious is that we have a very distinct, uh, that we have two very distinct clusters in both cases. That's very easy to explain because um, we have one big cluster for German and one big cluster for um, English. That's to be expected because the data that we used were automatically tagged for uh, being either English or German. And in the child-directed speech data, we don't have uh, any code mixing except for a little bit in uh, Fion's data. Um, and so we have these two big clusters uh, for the individual languages. Um, and uh, the red data here, or the, the ones with the red labels, are the English data. The ones with the blue labels are the uh, German data, and we see that there's a bit more diversity in terms of communities that are detected than in the English data, um, which partly has to do with the uh, uh, frequencies. It might also have to do with the uh, um, greater variability in German syntax. Um, that would be something that we would have to explore by taking closer look in the individual clusters. But we wanted to focus more on uh, what actually happens um, in the child uh, data. So I will actually uh, go to the um, to the data in child speech, and here we see the results in Fion's data uh, for three big time frames. Um, and uh, interesting, uh, and uh, here again, the the colors that we see as border colors are the individual languages. So um, in this case, red is English uh, is a German, and blue is um, English, and here we see the language shift so that we saw in the diagram that Antje showed. Um, so it's one particular characteristic of uh, these Fion data that he experiences a language shift from more dominant German to more dominant English in uh, his later speech, and that's really reflected in uh, this data set. Um, and if we uh, zoom in a bit more, then we see a couple of, uh, then we see these communities that we could um, explore in more detail if we had more uh, time, uh, but uh, we see lots of these uh, pivot schemas uh, in here. So um, we're basically uh, simplifying a bit. We have one cluster where we have uh, patterns like, uh, uh, like uh, simple NP patterns. So, uh, definite or indefinite article plus noun. Then we have uh, a cluster where we have a simple um, a pronoun plus verb um, combinations. And um, developmentally, uh, the interesting thing is, or one interesting thing among many others is that, for example, we uh, see a, a greater prominence of uh, ich and I, so uh, the first person pronoun, um, which we don't have in the early data because there we have a lot of pro drop in his uh, speech. And now uh, zooming in on only the code mix data, we see quite clearly that there are uh, lots of hubs that kind of serve as uh, the pivots again for um, code mixing, uh, for example, pronouns like this, um, but also uh, words like uh, und, so a German for and that are particularly um salient here. So for reasons of time, I will uh, just skip to the conclusion. So uh, we would argue that this dynamic network algorithm can be fruitfully applied to child data. Um, and uh, in the child data, we see uh, clearly distinct hubs uh, reflecting patterns of use. In the case of the code mixing data, um, but also in the case of the monolingual child data, uh, these communities that are detected point to the pivots that are particularly important for language uh, acquisition in general, but also, as we would argue, for language uh, switches in code mixing. Um, and uh, the network hubs 
also show to a certain extent how the code mixing patterns change over time, especially in the case of Fion with the switch of his um, dominant language. And overall, we see uh, once again that uh, these holistic uh, networks um, also show us that these children are basically making use of their full linguistic repertoire by combining their languages. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting. I'm sure that that is somebody with us. Comments. Thank you. Um, the uh, the visualization is so nice, especially with the CDS. It's so clear. And um, I wasn't with the children, but I actually um was wondering whether uh whether you get very similar results from this. So going back to the beginning, you were talking about the different yeah. methods. Um, do you do you end up getting similar results to chunking, for instance, or does or do you get some sort of different insight depending on which one you're looking at? This one, you're sort of it's a more holistic picture of the whole of the whole language use in the CDS and the chunking mm. speech. But is there some is there something else that comes out differently from these two? Ah, uh, that's a really interesting question. So I think to, to some extent, the methods are more or less complementary. So especially in the case of uh, the dynamic network model and the frequency filter method, because uh, both of them basically work with uh, bigrams and they both work with um, these transitional probabilities. Uh, so we could say that the frequency filter method basically fills the gap that we have with the dynam dynamic network because uh, this uh, the net the network can give us kind of an explorative view of um the bigram networks and the clusters we find but it doesn't really tell us so much about which of the words are over and underrepresented in comparison to the input so the frequency filter kind of um tries to make a direct relationship from the output of the child to the input um the child receives um, whereas the chunk-based learner uh, fills another gap in that it um, tries to detect uh, not only the connections between the individual words, but also the chunks that we can uh, detect here. And there's also a new development of the uh, chunk-based learner, which we haven't used yet, but it's really promising, um, where we can not only work with bigrams, but also with uh, skipgrams, which is kind of a problem with these methods that uh, they all work with bigrams, which is, of course, a, which offers a little bit of a limited perspective, uh, especially when it comes to relating uh, the children's data to the child-directed speech data, because here we, of course, expect very different bigrams in the child-directed speech data than in the um, children's data. And that's actually an advantage of the traceback method in the end, because here we have the frame and slot patterns, which are, uh, in a way, the... Um, um, sort of the main thing, whereas in the chunk-based learner uh, or in the other ones, uh, it's more about the chunks and uh, sort of one advantage also of the other two dynamic and frequency is here, we really sort of take the full corpus child-directed speech and um, the child speech into account, whereas in the traceback method, we basically, I mean, we also took um, parts of the whole corpus into account, but um, it's more or less like the patterns that we detected in the child data they then were traced back to the input, whereas here um, we basically um, cluster from the beginning. Thank you. That's really cool. <laughs> Indeed, yes, I might say uh, really credible and, and so on, and, and the visualizations are, are great as well. I'm a little bit familiar with the traceback method, but what not with the others, the new ones. So uh, I have a few stupid questions just to clarify my understanding. Okay. The first big question is that did you actually use a computational algorithm to analyze the data or did you have to do it by hand? I don't know that uh, at least in the case of these three methods it's mostly done automatically for traceback we partly worked with it's a mix. Uh, yeah it's, it's a mix so it's traceback <laughs> it was uh, partly uh, with the uh, help of engrams um but uh, other work uh, it really works in that way that you take basically record uh, utterances and then you trace it back to earlier recordings. And um, you can do that in a manual, but also in a semi-automatic uh, way. So. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
other questions? <laughs> Actually, we have time. So maybe yeah. during the coffee browse, <laughs> because I have also some questions. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Our next present case is about uh, much younger people. <laughs> and I'm older. Christina Jakaite Pudukiene to speak about the linguistic attitudes of Lithuanian and Lithuanian university students. So, good morning. Uh, I am Kristina Jakaita Bulbukena from Vilnius University. And, uh, <laughs> and today I'm going to speak about linguistic attitudes uh, of Lithuanian and Chinese university students towards their mother tongue and English. So, this is uh, a part of bigger research about on linguistic attitudes, language use, and language learning. Uh, my, or rather, say our target group were Chinese students in, Lit in Lithuania and China. And I did this research with my group of Chinese students from Beijing International is from Beijing International School of Languages, which were studying Lithuanian language at our university, Vilnius University. Uh, so we, we did quantitative survey and uh, I helped them with Lithuanian part and with uh, understanding what is social linguistics and we help me with Chinese part and with translation. Uh, uh, mostly our students, our respondents were bachelor degree students from 18 to 24. Uh, with older were master and uh, a PhD, but not a lot of them. And uh, we did these surveys as similar as it was possible. Uh, of course, we had to do some changes. For example, when we asked about the most beautiful languages in China, it was another possibilities and about most needed languages, also another possibilities with questions when we have about uh, numbers. For example, we asked where were you born? So in village in Lithuania, it's 10 people. In village in China, it's about much more bigger. So, uh, and we decided to choose only one mother tongue. So in Lithuania, it was Lithuanian, and in China, it was Chinese Mandarin. Uh, here we have to understand that Chinese Mandarin, it's not one language, but it's a group of languages and dialects. And to this group belongs a Beijing dialect, which was a background of modern standard Chinese uh, language. Uh, some of our respondents have two mother tongues, but uh, not not much. Uh, and uh, as Gareth pointed out, that attitudes uh, is stable. We can identify them, and we learn attitudes. Uh, two important sources of attitudes are our personal experience and our social environment, including the media. And if uh, I have to stop here and to say 
if uh, if there is no similar things bet among between Lithuania and China, because we are different in everything: size, history, culture, traditional religion, uh, uh, history of education, history of language, and. Uh, uh, let's say one thing is similar, this thing is globalization. That's all. And if attitudes to mother tongue and to English are different, so it's clear why, because we learn attitudes. If it is quite similar, so it was it is very interesting to interpret why it's similar. And uh, I think you know this popular idea of Baker that uh, uh, in the life of a language, attitudes to that language appear to be important in the language restoration, preservation, decay, or death. Uh, so, uh, and from survey of linguistic attitudes, we can say the future of the language. And uh, so I hoped that I will see <laughs> what future awaits Lithuanian language or even Chinese language from these attitudes. And uh, I know with numbers, it's quantitative survey, and I worked uh, with these numbers several times, but I still don't know what is my conclusions. So I hope maybe you will <laughs> help me with conclusions. Let's start. So I will start from linguistic attitudes towards mother tongue. And, and uh, as you see here, uh, these are the most popular answers when we ask what first word goes to your mind when you think about your native language? And uh, we asked for one word, but usually it was one or two or three sentences. And uh, so I just extracted the most popular words. And we seem very similar, but we are not similar because... Uh, <laughs> For example, this word very words very old. When Chinese students write about we about very old, so we write about we their long history of writing system. When Lithuanians write about the fact that Lithuanian language is very old, they write that it is archaic and similar to the pro-language of Indo-European languages. Uh, in our schools, students learn this fact, and we do not question whether it's true or not. Uh, another difference goes with description of the, the word beautiful. Uh, Lithuanian students wrote, uh, wrote beautiful, and together with this word was poetic, cozy, like a flowing stream, singing. Then Chinese students wrote word beautiful. So next to him was elegant, deep, and wide. Interestingly, that the word elegant was used to describe the standard language used in China 1,500 years ago. And uh, we could say that attitudes to, to mother tongue is um, positive and very positive. But it is one but, and this but is in the word complicated. So this is first, second, third. So word complicated is in the first place. And uh, boom, 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 boom. We know from previous researches about the attitudes of Lithuanian citizens that uh, people in Lithuania think that Lithuanian language is complicated not only for foreigners, but for them also. And they 
feel that we cannot properly learn uh, Lithuanian language and uh, for example <laughs> the only words that come to my mind are hard, old and complicated. Even though it was hard to learn it, I still love it. So why it happens that people feel that they cannot properly learn uh, uh, their native language. Uh, it could be several reasons, and one of the reasons, maybe dialect is quite different from standard, and it's very difficult to learn proper accentu accentuation system rules, maybe spelling, maybe just boring Lithuanian language lessons. Uh -huh. Uh, Chinese students also say that their language is difficult, but it is difficult for foreigners. Example, the most beautiful language in the world, but the most difficult for foreigners to learn. And next thing, the most beautiful language in the world. So for Lithuanian students, it's Lithuanian. But and other languages, French, Italian, Spanish, Latin. And the main answer, most popular, this language sounds beautiful. For Chinese students, it's Chinese. Only two from 124, right? That it is another language, so it was Russian and Korean. <laughs> and there is no English among these languages at all. Maybe down three or four Lithuanians write this. Why if these languages are no, the most beautiful? So I think here we can see that uh, these languages, like French, were prestigious. Latin, it was in our educational history. Italian, Spanish, uh, French music and films is popular in Lithuania, so maybe the sculpture <laughs> art affects us. <laughs> Why for Chinese students, most beautiful language is Chinese? I don't know. I think it goes together with standardization. Uh, this idea that standard language is the most beautiful, uh, it goes together like cognitive attitudes, not like emotional attitudes. A interesting here, to, interesting fact here to say that then we ask Lithuanians about what beautiful language, the most beautiful. Usually we don't think about Lithuanian. We think that we are, they were asked about other languages. Now attitudes about uh, towards English. Uh, how many students learn English? <laughs> the simple answer would be nine of them. Almost all learn English and think that English is the second best their language. Uh, I have five minutes, so I say the most interesting facts. Lithuanians learn English and at university because it's curriculum and on their own. It's 73, I think, percent that, that they learn on their own. And uh, they learn English for better education, better job, and more interesting leisure time. And half of the Lithuanians spend with English every day a lot. Half of them, and later than every second day or two times per week. If we talk about Chinese students, so first of all, we learn English to pass English exam better and to get better score and better education. If they study at university uh, with private tutor, 
it was one set of students on that awesome courses and on their own, but much less than Lithuanians. And we say that we ask oh, an open question that we want to, to learn English to get better job, better education, but also that there is no such need. If we don't know English, it's also okay because Chinese is in, enough in China. <laughs> uh, also, we asked how what we think about these statements. And uh, one said one fifth of Chinese students and almost half. Uh, <laughs> Agree, agree or strongly agree with this. I don't think it's necessary to learn other foreign languages because English is enough. And this number is very strange number because it, it's just one fifth, but we know from our survey that half of Chinese students don't have another second a foreign language. So it's just emotion, not, not fact. We are not going to learn another language. <laughs> and here uh, we see that uh, not a lot of Chinese students and one set of Lithuanians uh, agree or strongly agree with the statement, I feel that English is a threat to my mother tongue. And what is my conclusions? So for me, it was uh, very interesting to understand that mother tongue is mother tongue. Doesn't matter, it is in Lithuania or in China. And how these simple words as beautiful, old and other would have such different meaning. Another thing that it is what uh, for me interesting to understand that standardization does uh, different work with languages. So for Lithuanians, we are proud of their difficult language. We it's it sounds beautiful, like singing to them but we feel that it's, it is too complicated to, to, to learn standard language. Chinese and opposite are proud of long history, especially of writing system. They think their language beautiful, all of them, deep, wide, but simple to use and to learn. And I think there is no possibility to compete with English because nine of 10 students said that is their best foreign language, language and uh, 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 half of Chinese students said that they do not have second foreign language at all. Maybe they learn some, learn something language, but they don't feel that they can write about it. So the main uh, factors that influence language attitudes, I would say size of the country, standardization, ideas which go with standardization, and the history of language itself. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Just a uh, such question. Uh, usually, power relations play important uh, role in the case of attitudes concerning languages. So, behind every language, there is a network of uh, power uh, agents. And uh, you mentioned that uh, English is uh, not edible for uh, Chinese, it's never beautiful. What about Lithuanians concerning the Russian language? About about beautiful, uh, I I can, uh, you know, 
about Lithuanians. I think 87 or 88 first second language is Lithuanian and 11% it's Russian. When we talk about second foreign language, so about half of Lithuanian says that it's Russian and uh, of other languages that we learn at school, German, French, uh, Spanish, uh, Latin. And uh, I think it, it, it wasn't that it is beautiful for no one, I think. Or maybe it was like one, two, three that goes to other. <laughs> no, at all. English it was a little bit, three or four, but no, not no Russian. And our survey was before the war in 22. Yeah, I just have a comment. Uh, so so uh, in Lithuania, well, you know, and I know, and many people know that the discourse about the standard language, I think it's unhealthy. Unhealthy, yeah? yes. Because, uh, well, using the Soviet expression, a group of comrades has, uh, uh, has language planning institution in their hands. And so, and they mm -hmm. impose their own idea of what is mutable and what is correct and what should be banned. And so, so this is how, this is why uh, these um, students think that Lithuania is complex because uh, uh, I've heard Lithuania say, well, we don't know our mother tongue. No. Oh, oh, come on. How is it possible? It is exactly because there are some unnecessary, you know, unnecessary complications. Nobody uses Lithuanian in, the, in a certain way, but, but language planners think that everybody should use it. And so it is if you uh, pass a formal exam and you're going to miss Yeah, yeah. So this yes. is the problem. We go now in, in the way of liberalization, yeah, but we students yeah. uh, finished school when it was very strict. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will follow with something absolutely different. Analytic and uh, and no lecture. Machine translation come wrong for normal bilingual speech. No. So, uh, the audience, so this is something that, well, I would like to share with you and ask your opinions whether I should write an article about it or just a funny thing and, and forget it. So, uh, the if you don't know Estonian, you wouldn't figure it out. No, leket would mean no, no, yeah, Birbe is laughing, no leaks. So, um, so I'm very grateful to my PhD student, Gaidi Kilp, who just by accident uh, discovered this um, text. She was looking for something for her car. And so I don't know anything about cars in any language. So, so uh, I am looking purely at the linguistic side of it. So, and Gady shared it with our, um, uh, uh, in our chat, in uh, messenger chat of our project. And so, you know, the text uh, itself uh, looks funny for both um, who know, uh, for those who know both languages, but if you know only one language of well, uh, of, uh, of the pair is uh, quite enough. Uh, so the research question is, I will show you this uh, the parts uh, of the text so you will understand what is wrong there. Or is it really wrong? 
Yes. So is it just an idiosyncratic combination of words and structures from both languages, Estonian and English, and mixed in some uh, random way? Or uh, we get something that has been actually attested in naturalistic <laughs> bilingual Estonian English communication. So it means that if uh, we look at this uh, text, yes, we have to, I would use trace back, but in a different sense. So we have to look whether such phenomena have been attested in the literature about Estonian English uh, bilingual uh, speech and writing. So this is, you cannot see, it. I, I can share the slides later if you want. So something like it's uh, 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 the text is quite long. So this green shot is short is of a, uh, the beginning. So you have something like Tode uh, eliminates excess moisture, ensuring comfort and ja ohutus of starting your daily commute course a clear <laughs> windshield uh, and so on. Yeah. So uh, the text, uh, it was, uh, it, it is funny. So the text was av available. So I copied it, I saved it. And then when I was writing the um, abstract for this conference, it was not available. So I indicated <laughs> in the abstract, it's not available. Now it's available again. So some kind of mysterious text. Uh, so you can follow the link in the uh, abstract. So my departure point, uh, so, uh, Contactly used language change is not regulated by uh, absolute constraints, but there is no uh, chaotic change. So there are some tendencies, there are some inclinations, but um, no strict. So you cannot say that such and such a thing is impossible when you derive it from a uh, formal uh, side of the language. So. Uh, what is useful here, when I uh, I keep reading um, literature on, uh, well, contact in use language change and code switching in particular. And uh, well, in my opinion, it doesn't work well when both languages have little or no inflection morphology because, uh, well, I, I mean, uh, the, your view is um, then uh, somehow, limited. So in this case, Estonian has a lot of inflection morphology, and uh, this is important. You will see why. Uh, so, and of course, it is not going back to the issue of constraints. It's not just a combination of uh, two monolingual grammars or two monolingual lexicons. So something new can uh, emerge in the process of language context. So uh, earlier research at Bacchus, um, who unfortunately couldn't come to this conference this year, uh, in an earlier article indicates that uh, uh, an, a code switched item can kind of drag along morphosyntactic properties. And so if it's not just a word you insert, but it, it may change the morphosyntax of the main language. So. Uh, uh, no leket, so the title I chose for this presentation. So in Estonian, if you have negation, you have partitive, the partitive case. So a mingate leket, pole leket, and something like this. So leket, it would be partitive, plural. Um, so, but you have the English negative particle no, and which drags along, yeah. Uh, English properties, which means English has no grammatical cases, which means, but there is plural. So you get Estonian plural there. So this is the mechanism here. So uh, Estonian noun, the Estonian noun gets only um, nominative plural marker, and that's it. So uh, what is quite interesting when you have English preposition before an Estonian uh, noun, so a noun phrase. So there are cases where the phrase starts, the phrase is in Estonian, then you have an English preposition and the rest is in Estonian. Saataval in kaks mõõdud sobib, I cannot pronounce this, on esimene paneel, 
or you have an English clause and preposition, and the, then it goes on in Estonian, an indicator on Tode to recharge by Vahetus will tell you uh, it on Aeg. So this is interesting because um, uh, uh, on time, but it's also about semantics. So, so what is in naturalistic speech? We have examples like shout out to, click kollas et värviliset riidet, and so on. So we have two and Estonian, the Estonian noun gets, well, if necessary, you get the Estonian noun and adjective get uh, plural markers, but no case marking. Or kiri from rimmen, you would say in Estonian kiri rimmelilt, because Estonian has a lot of cases, if you guessed. There are some prepositions and postpositions, but in, in phrases like this, you get some case ending. So, uh, uh, Estonian content word insertions in English metrics. So usually, yeah, uh, you get the other way around. Uh, but why? Because the social linguistic situation is like that. I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, what we have here over egg, a car interior accumulates quite a lot of humidity, fog, uh, fogging up windows, yeah, making it PR impossible to see a road. So, uh, you have conjunctions and like the hedges, like armiselt extremely peaaiko. So this is normal. This is normal in context in use the language change in language context that discourse particles and conjunctions are very likely to be borrowed. So uh, per se, it's uh, quite uh, possible. But. Um, what about the situation when the main language is English and you have some Estonian insertion? Uh, we have um, a different social linguistic situ situation, or at least what I know uh, is where typically uh, these languages can be intertwined, or you have the English, uh, sorry, Estonian is the main language, morphosyntactically still, and you have English insertions, or you have what is called code alternation, so chunks of both language monolingual chunks. Uh, still, there is anecdotal evidence. In uh, 2013, I got such a message from my PhD student, and of course I saved it, because it was remarkable. Of course, it, you can say that um, the student was writing it and, uh, you know, ha having fun, because the student knows Estonian as well. Uh, so, hi, Anna, when would be a good day to collect, collect my Yuhan Dai Arvamus and get your signature to the Arwan, so etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So so you, you get this English um, and some Estonian insertion. So it's not impossible. Um, mixed copies. So there is a thing that is called um, it's, it's a very handy uh, very handy concept. Uh, so I'm all the time. I'm talking about mixed copying. Some of my colleagues can uh, sure they have noticed. So you have multi-word item. It can be a fixed expression or compound noun, analytic verb, verb idiomatic expression, uh, where the combination of items and the overall semantics is from one language, but some elements are from another. So this is an example from this text is as if as gives you as kui as. It's very difficult uh, to pronounce Estonian. So in Estonian, you don't say it in this way. Kui uh, is if in Estonian. Over time, well, it's a fixed expression. Over time, uh, you would say chunk. Um, uh, over aik, Estonian aik. But you, the, the logic here is English over time, non Estonian logic. So, idiom subject to, <laughs> sorry, mixed copying. Two birds with one stone gives you cox, a bird scores, ukski. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. So, in Estonian, our uh, course is with and together or together, ux is one and kibi is stone. So numerals in Estonian demand partitive case, except one, partitive singular. So it should be kaks lindu. 
So uh, there is like in Cox Moodle, we have it already. So we have uh, Estonian numeral, but then you have uh, plural instead of partitive, nominative plural instead of partitive singular. There is circumstantial evidence from my previous research. So Yiddish Estonian code switching with a numeral streiten zwischen Kaxerakonat. Two. Should be Kahe Erakonna Vahel. So it's an usual choice of preposition because course means not only with but together. So monolingual Estonian would use instrumental case. So you can compare with the Estonian idiom Kokskarpes to a hobika. So like two flies with one blow, which is which means the same, more or less the same. So what should it be? Cox birds with ukskivi, Cox birdsy with ukskivi, Cox birdsy with ukskivi, Cox birds uhe kiviga. <laughs> so mixed copies in naturalistic speech are likely to appear in compounds. <laughs> so these are all real examples. So, yes, there are mixed copies, but they are uh, they're different in nature. So they are different, not like in this text. And there are no <laughs> mixed copies of idioms in not not in my data in naturalistic speech. So what is wrong? What is really wrong, but it's in uh, quotation marks because I <laughs> no. Um, so the description, product description should be I know it's a very complicated type. So yeah, genitive is doesn't have a, any ending. It's just the change of duration, whatever. So this sounds as wrong, but it's Estonian wrong. No English is here. And then non-existent verbal stem will never leak, will never leak. Of course, you can recognize note Germanic stem, borrowed stem in Estonian, lekkima. So Estonian, the Estonian verb is lekkima, lekkida, lekkip, to leak. So doesn't leak is a lekki. Doesn't leak or will not leak. So will never lekkip. Will never lekki, yeah, because in uh, in uh, the negative you have uh, the uh, negative particle and just the stem of the verb in Estonian. I think it's it sounds kind of will never lekki is well sounds counterintuitive. <clears throat> of course, in Estonian you then have this thing when well the same exactly the same is the verb and the noun. So in Estonian. Verbs have uh, endings and nouns have endings. So in the nominative singular, you don't have any ending, but it's different from the verb. So maybe this is uh, why, because it doesn't work. So discussion and pre preliminary conclusions. So if you think about insertions in classical code switching, yeah, I remember this small letter from my students in English with Estonian insertions, all these were semantically specific items. So they're mostly, usually they're nouns, not only, but they're nouns. They are term-like items. So something that is, they come handy in, you don't, you, you don't have a translation equivalent, or even if you have, you don't want to think about them because they are here at your disposal and everybody understands them in the same way. Or there are expressive uh, words and figurative expressions and items crucial for shaping of discourse, like discourse particles and conjunction. <laughs> so it is a kind, I think that is a kind of meaning that enhances this code switching. But do insertions in th this case fit into these categories? Are they either semantically specific or expressive or crucial for shaping of discourse, yes, conjunctions. But what other things, I don't know. 
And it's a more philosophical question, does machine translation differentiate between different types of meaning, like specifics, or I don't know. It just occurred to me, this question. So, um, and I think we need acceptability tests. Yeah. There were some, uh, some um, constructions or some uh, examples where I was not sure. I would say that uh, it doesn't sound right, but there are other speakers. And as we know, uh, well, speakers, speakers with the same so-called mother tongue have, may have different perception of what is right or wrong. And especially when this contact induced language change is very new. So uh, the, uh, my colleagues and uh, I, we have some methods for this, uh, how to test this. So maybe we have to test these things. But uh, in a more general um, uh, note or the more general note, the text is not just idiosyncratic or chaotic or just a, a gibberish. It has many, as you saw, as you just seen, many characteristics of naturalistic bilingual Estonian English speech and writing. The question is in frequency and distribution of items. So these are my references. If you want, I can share my slides with you. And well, thank you. Thank you. And now we have five minutes for question. I'm sorry. So, okay. We usually have a feeling that I will you like to contact the author and so I'll get to the bottom of things. <laughs> well, the author. The author, you, you mean the manager of the site? Because uh, I opened it and I can see that uh, it's still go by Cox Hill and Hayes, so I should see one of their employees. <laughs> well, I thank you. Actually, this uh, might be a nice idea, but I'm afraid because be that people are very sensitive to the issues of language. Because I, if I write something like this, they'll say, well, there is a customer who feels that we do something wrong and well, but thank you. We shall think about it. If you want, then I will. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe you can, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, I would appreciate it. Uh, yes, so uh, that's about your question as an opinion uh, about computational linguists. So I can say that the machine translation would not produce something like that, uh, <laughs> uh, especially for uh, phrases like uh, over time, it should, uh, like statistically, it should definitely be able to produce an English mm -hmm. translation. Uh, and a Sonian translation, you yeah, know, uh, because yeah, uh, probably the base language was English. Uh, uh, it didn't seem like it honestly because uh, it's uh, more probable that it does uh, like the grammatical forms or things like that in Estonian than in English. Uh, but the Estonian was perfect. <laughs> it was not well. Uh, it was not to to the to the It was not perfect Estonian. Mm. Yeah. Well, it seems like Cox guess, Cox. Uh, whatever, Cox Mudut. It's very far from perfect Estonian. Okay, yeah, I just couldn't remember. Oh, well, well, but they didn't think we can discuss it. So yeah. then who who produced this text? Yeah, but uh, also as uh, uh, quite a young person, <laughs> I can say that uh, this, this kinds of uh, like bilingual speech where English is the main one and uh, there are like inserts of Estonian. Uh, it's something that I have definitely seen. In oh, we, we, we will talk about it then. I, because I, I would love to see it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for the so interesting uh, uh, research. Did you also discover some pronunciation changes? Because I think when you have this kind of mixed sentence and it's an oral speech, you must decide which Estonian or English pronunciation is the correct. And if this part, Rexodia, is really making 
Maybe well, this is well. This is a written text, so we don't have a voice uh, recording behind it. Well, in general, I don't know because again, uh, it is not like it's it's it, yes and no. Yes, I I, I have not paid uh, attention to pronunciation in particular. In I mean, in Estonian uh, English. Uh, context, but uh, sometimes um, you see you you can with the same speaker can produce different kind of pronunciation because well I have Estonian Russian examples so something that I know so so uh, people may say in one context well using Estonian word Yanipa they will say Yanipa something like yeah. this. Uh, something like this, or Yanni uh, Pav, or so, so it can be. You see, it it is not like you decide you, you because in some social contexts you would strive for two perfect monolingual pronunciations. In some not, and some people are not able. Uh, they are not able to produce without an accent. So they are not taught to. Them. Well, uh, well, they're all kind of like yes, of course. I I, I understand they are not they acquire language. Well, we we, um, well, say not under ideal circumstances. Thank you. Very oh, short. Very short. Well, I, I just I mean I I agree with Gertrude that um, uh, it doesn't look at all like it doesn't look like either natural or bilingual usage mm -hmm. and it doesn't look like machine translation. Machine translation these days is very good. Really? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's much better than that. And uh, clever in machine translation, you get, it, it's interesting to look at what, what sorts of patterns from one language, uh, you okay. know, from one language. Well, it improves. I, 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 into the other language. But 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 you don't get these kinds of, you know, these kinds of things like cause or, or, you know, I mean, if you're using machine translation, any kind of modern machine translation, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't get those kinds of items, inserted elements. But have you so tried a lot of English Estonian machine? I'm just curious. Sorry. Have you tried a lot uh, English Estonian machine translation? I've tried a lot of different pairs, yeah. Uh -huh. I tried a lot of different pairs because, uh, well, uh, some pair, I think some pairs do not work. The or... thing is, this doesn't look like a human translation either. It looks so... So... You said in your final slide, you had something You had something where you said that it does have marks of not bilingual, natural. Uh, yeah, well, well, but, but maybe it's, it's not because... But, well, it has marks of naturalistic speech but it doesn't yes because because on the uh, from the looking from another angle it's so well you combine structures and lexicon from the two languages so there is a chance you get something that looks like real but it doesn't mean that it's just like uh, like so who is the author then is the research question i said that Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, but we have now have time it. for the next presentation. <laughs> and our last presentation is uh, Alba. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he will speak about the functions of multilingual application as well. In the story uh, uh, all right, uh, thank you very much for accepting me here. And yes, I will try to keep the, the housekeeping part very short because I have way too many slides. Um, oh, it's not working somehow. Uh, but this basically uh, based on an article which uh, came out already. So it's a collaboration between myself and Dr. Imogen Marcus, who is a, a senior lecturer at Ormskirk University near Liverpool. And it was called The Long History of Shortening a Diachronic Analysis of Abbreviation Practices from the 15th to the 21st century came out in English language and linguistics earlier this year. Um, 
And this is basically elaborating on the multilingual part because we did encode language in a database, but there was no space to discuss it in the article. But um, the point of the article was that abbreviation is something which is present in written text from any period, but it's rarely treated as such. And we aim to provide kind of descriptive statistics and some observations and foundation for future work uh, for its developments using a unified typology for all periods and then data from late medieval corpora to 21st century corpora. And yeah, today I will focus on things which we tagged as Latin or French in the corpora. So abbreviation is a topic which somewhat flies under the radar. So if you look at manuals, uh, recommendations, uh, style guides for language, this one is from a Finnish one by Nurmi 2004 called Kirjoittaja and ABC, so writers ABC. I'll, write the, uh, I'll read the English translation. Uh, these days in written language, various kinds of abbreviations are increasingly common. They include various combinations of letters, abbreviated words and symbols used instead of words. Many familiar abbreviations are useful and even necessary, but using too many abbreviations is distracting. The writer should think about the reader who has to understand the abbreviation. So some very sound advice that these things can be very useful, but on the other hand, please keep the reader in mind so it needs to be intelligible. And then it repeats this belief that uh, in today's language, various kinds of abbreviations are getting increasingly frequent. Uh, if you ask many theoretical linguists, then abbreviation and other things related to writing systems are of very much secondary importance and not that interesting. So um, usually like um, sources on lexicology, uh, such as Bauer 2022, which we used in um, our lexicology course at Tallinn University, they are a, a group this minor word formation process. Uh, or some abbreviation types are listed under minor word formation processes. Major word formation processes would be, of course, affixation and compounding and things like that. But they will list things like acronyms, which are read as a full word, like NATO, because the phonotactics um, enable them to be read as words. Initialisms like CEO, read letter by letter. And then clippings, so you come up with fancy uh, Greek Latin words like aeroplane or refrigerator, and then in actual speech they get shortened to plane or fridge or uh, buses from omnibus or premise from perambulator originally, and then in spoken language you get a lab from laboratory or bike from bicycle. Uh, so most sort of general linguistic lexicological sources don't really deal with abbreviations all that much. However, they did take center stage in uh, computer mediate communication, especially what has later been dubbed as the first wave of computer mediated communication or CMC. So in 2001, David Crystal wrote about NetSpeak and uh, Brenda Dane published a work called Cyberplay about the language of the internet and they listed abbreviations and emoticons and non-standard spellings as typical characteristics. In later CMC, this is kind of has been criticized because I mean, as we know, internet is a lot of things. It's not just sort of one uh, simple monolithic NetSpeak. But around the time, there were also things like um, kind of a kind of a meme, except it was before social media. But people would email each other with this text, which is allegedly a school essay written exclusively in SMS abbreviation. And around two thousand three, it was uh, mailed around, and then uh, the people who have looked at it now think that yeah it was probably a hoax so someone just made up the whole thing which is shocking like how can someone post something on the internet which is not true <laughs> um but anyway if we turn back the clock some centuries you may come across uh, text types which are at least as heavily if not more heavily abbreviated than anything you get in cmc so this is from uh, around the time of emperor nero from Cologne, a uh, Romanized part of Germany, and Imperator Nero Caesar Augustus Divi, Claudi, Filius, Germanici, Caesaris, Nepos, Tiberi, Caesaris, Augusti, and so on. And at least 50% of the words are abbreviated. And if you look at coins and things like that, you will get text types where you will get to 100% abbreviation. So it's also very central to ancient inscriptions. And I couldn't resist 
putting this one in here. So there's a, a kind of satirical puzzle from 1796. It says, uh, it says over there, um, uh, to the penetrating geniuses of Oxford, Cambridge, Eton, Westminster, and the Learned Society of Antiquarians, this curious inscription is humbly dedicated. Can you see what it reads? It says actually, uh, beneath the stone reposes Claude Coster, tribe seller of Impington, as doth his consort Jane. Um, so there's actually no abbreviations. There's just weird punctuation and word division. So, so, um, so to summarize, abbreviations are by most uh, in a lot of linguistics are considered to be a minor phenomenon in lexicology and general linguistics. Uh, there is kind of a general belief that it's a modern phenomenon and increasingly in modern language um, make it abbreviated. Uh, abbreviations have been studied quite a bit in CMC, so there are more recent publications on Twitter and things like that. Classical philology, also medieval studies, but these disciplines are pretty compartmentalized and don't necessarily interact with each other and know what each other are doing. So the plan with this study was precisely to do with that. So for once, take abbreviation as something which is present in written communication and uh, see how it works. And the research questions were, um, how frequent is abbreviation in each historical period? Uh, what forms of abbreviations are used in each period and how common are they? So what kinds of abbreviation are there? Uh, what kind of lexemes get abbreviated in different periods? And this requires some definitions. So we took for, took it from a CMC study by B. Swanger 2013. So defining abbreviation as all strategies that results in lexical forms that are made up by fewer characters than the full form or a combination of words. So like anything which results in a sort of abbreviated lexeme, which is shorter than a full form. Uh, it has some implications. So consider something to be abbreviation only if the full form is still extant. So uh, bus comes from omnibus, but I think most people, if you ask them, they will not consider it bus to be an abbreviation as an omnibus in London, 1895. Um, or, and then also that the abbreviated form is shorter than the full form. Uh, we decided to include spellings that uh, reflect spoken language. So it's or can't or things like this uh, because they are shorter than the full form. Uh, methodology was uh, we had with a quantitative analysis of abbreviation frequency in four periods in the history of English. So we had uh, 21st century, some WhatsApp messages from Scotland and England sent around 2017, 2018. Then late modern English, uh, early modern English, and middle English. So we collected a data set of abbreviated spellings in each subcorpus and annotated them for abbreviation form and lexeme category. And then we did some exploratory quantitative analysis, including some descriptive statistics, more specifically log likelihood tests. And yeah, here's the corpora basically. So the uh, starting point was uh, this by my collaborator. Uh, so she has a historical corpus of written English. And then it's kind of difficult when you have instant messaging as the text type, but we tried to find earlier text types, which would have, which would be either informal as in the way of conversation or then written down very quickly. And we had three from Middle English period through Middle English local documents corpus. So we had letters, statements, receipts, hoping they are written down quickly or memoranda. So things written down for note. Then um, for early modern period, we had some English witness depositions. So these are court testimonies where the scribe taking down from dictation, hoping that would be instantaneous, some letters. And then for late modern period, we had uh, some more letters. And these are examples from the corpora. So here's a WhatsApp message sent in England around 2018, February. It says various things like, sorry, I've not been in touch. I've been doing teaching, etc. in a day uh, so far as quite pushed from the time when in Bris, uh, for Bristol, I'll be around on Wednesday, so abbreviating day of the week. Then uh, go back some 150 years, it says, uh, thanks for yours also for your chap, which is abbreviation for chapter here. The letter depressed me, but I will try and live till next week. So at, at the at mark instead of end, then, like in both of them, abbreviate day of the week. So Wednesday, Saturday, I go to matinee of mini. So abbreviating the surname. 
then here's a letter from 1660. Our adversary Studholm was apprehended yesterday by Sir William Carlton. So they like superscript abbreviations. So Sir is written with S and then superscript R. Uh, the house of one sturdy Quaker, there's a dangerous accusation put in against him as the life of majesty and majesty is also with the superscripts. But then you have the doctor abbreviated precisely the same day as it is today. And there's etc. like we had in the 2018 example, except the spelling is a bit different. And then there's uh, one late medieval one. So uh, the Friday next before the feast of St. Clement. So in here, they actually uh, you like to use, because it's handwritten text, they use this kind of squiggly thing. Schools, Rebbe Crafts, St. Clement, and the year will have a squiggly thing. King Edward IV, so reign of Queen Edward IV. Um, this received by the hands of Stephen, and you get sort of various things added to the letters. And we had framework like this. So uh, this basically what we work with. So we have abbreviations, we look similar. So we have though, and though, which can stand for Thomas. So we have the expanded form, or it can stand for though. Both of these would be clippings, but the lexeme category in the first one is a name and it's a function word for the second one. And then we had the category for language, which we didn't have space to discuss in the actual article, but I'm doing that now. Or then you would have acronyms like PS for postscriptum or WTF for what the fuck. Uh, and then we had lexeme categories like a discursive, a metadiscursive item for PS. And then exclamation and PS would be Latin, whereas um, a WTF is English acronym. And uh, there's um, the categories we came up with are the following. They're kind of a mesh from medieval studies and lexicology. So we uh, used both. Uh, but we had acronyms and initialisms grouped together because for the earlier periods, it's difficult to be certain how it was actually pronounced, how it was read out aloud. Uh, clippings when something is clipped from the end. Contractions is kind of a, what they have in medieval studies and classical studies. Something is abbreviated by leading things out in the middle. Then we grouped informal spellings and elisions together. So wanna, gonna, so on. Then we had, did have a category for letter number homophones, which would be like a, uh, popularly known as um, SMS abbreviations, but not no one actually used them. No, not a single informant used these things like before or see you. Then logograms, which are kind of interesting from writing system point of view, because they are somewhat similar to like Chinese, where you have a, a character standing for an entire word like and or at or you know, things. Um, and then uh, brevicrafts are this very medieval category where you use handwritten squiggles and then superscript letters. And, and then we had lexeme categories like oh, uh, date, time, names, titles, address forms, discourses, and method discourses, function words, measurements, other lexical words, ordinal numbers, exclamation, brand, and organizational names. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's five minutes for results. Um, so these are normalized by a thousand, but they kind of correspond with uh, percentages. So the highest number of abbreviated in the medieval uh, corpora, so around 14% of the words are abbreviated. Then it comes down to something like 8% for the early modern Renaissance period. Then late modern is the lowest. Uh, it comes down to less than 4% of the words abbreviated, and then it increases to 21st century again. And then what happens with abbreviation forms? Um, like the brevicrats are a really massive category in Middle English. So they just uh, are completely in a uh, league of their own and they are still used in the modern period and then they virtually disappear. If we leave brevicrats out, we do see that uh, kind of acronyms and initialisms do increase towards the present day. Uh, superscript abbreviations were really popular in the early modern period, around 1600. These days, I guess they're used for numerals. If you type in like fourth in Microsoft Word, we'll want to put in the superscript, but uh, other than that, not, but the really big increase is actually elisions. So what people actually do when they um, write uh, is use elisions and they are, there's like gravity crafts, here's some examples. So there's every, they use this kind of squiggle for it or viz which is from Videlice. So it used to be in the Middle Ages, this squiggly thing, and later is spelled with a Z. Uh, superscripts kind of peak at one point and 
biggest increase in 20th century happens with allusions and informal spellings. So what people use are things like I've been doing teaching, etc. Sorry, I've not been in touch. I'll be around on Wednesday. Uh, and I guess because there's automatic text correction. So uh, it's kind of an informal text type when you type with um, a WhatsApp and then it will suggest these types of things. And out of 786 editions, only 34 were informal spellings like wanna, babo, or ticks, or tickets, or uh, defo props. Most were just these types of things. Um, and then on the multilingual front, so um, also kind of similar, a French was really marginal in this uh, this corpora, but similar Middle English is the highest and early modern English, late modern English, 21st century English. Um, and then things uh, in Latin are etc. cetera, uh, item, memum, md for memorandum, then you have propria with these kind of squiggly lines, meaning someone wrote it down in their own hand, mano propria, per Robertus, and then you have regnal years like H meeting King Henry year of Henrik also Henrik and these things continue uh, late modern English you have IE circa PS etc you have both spellings present day English I think it's basically down to AM PM etc and PS and then with WhatsApp people discuss meeting somewhere at a certain time so AM and PM will be used a lot uh, so we have the category discursive and meta discursive. So the only thing which is found in every single period is etc. So it's and it's somewhat frequent in all of the periods. Then there were other Latin ones like nota memorandum item, which do not carry over from Middle English to later ones. Uh, this we didn't have in the earlier period, but it definitely exists. But we had in early modern period that things like go for ergo, and ps is also definitely attested earlier, but we didn't have it in our corpora. But then on the other hand, with confirmatory communication, they came up with a whole bunch of new discourse and meta-discourse organizing. Uh, and also in here, uh, some categories, date and time are abbreviated in all of them. For example, October is found abbreviated in all of them. It gets kind of more hectic, more down to detail, because in later period, People discuss um, hours versus just days in the earlier periods. And I think AM and PM account for a lot of the Latin use. Uh, French, I looked at the middle English, and it's, there are not very many and kind of probably require going through them. Again, they're kind of a mess. Late modern English, there was just one person, Ernst Dowsen, who wrote C and Levre. Present day English, we had CDG as in Charles de Gaulle Airport, <laughs> and I guess that counts as French. <laughs> so uh, French is very marginal in here. But anyway, uh, I, this is actually the final slide. So results, uh, Latin is common, commonly in all periods in discursive metadiscursive periods. Some expressions of time are in Latin. And the, this does decrease over time. But then on the other hand, it seems that when you have discourse organizing abbreviations, they can also become fossilized and formulaic and extremely successful. When you have things like etc. or PS, they are just very good in doing their particular function and people use them and don't pay much attention to them, but they have been around for centuries and that do reflect these things. And then later, people would be okay. So uh, in the late modern corpus, all of the informant subreds and not a single one used them, but then it was really popular in the 21st century. So that would be kind of also type of abbreviation, which is very popular. French usage was very, very sporadic in our data, but when we didn't have things like the RSVP in English, it's a French formula for RSVP, s'il vous plaît, but we didn't find it in the data. So yeah, that's actually it. Thank you. Questions or comments? Yeah. Well, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, uh, just one question uh, regarding the comparability of the different periods, because you know the, the question came to my mind when you showed us the Latin uh, scripts, and I, you know, asked myself, well, what, what are the types of texts that actually are preserved from the past? Mm -hmm. We can actually. Uh, and make this wonderful comparison. So 
that's one thing. You know, the, the writing was confined to a limited number of persons, and those texts which are actually written were perhaps more formal than those texts which you examine for the contemporary language, which mm -hmm. are everyday language, which you can write because you, you know, write WhatsApp messages all the time, and so on. So uh, there were periods where, for example, um, paper was expensive and mm. you would like think what, what to write and how to abbreviate things because the, the children and so, so on so on. So are those things actually comparable mm. uh, well in terms of formality and, mm. and types of text and so on? Uh, they are not comparable, but unfortunately uh, we use what we have. So the idea was that um, what does instant messaging uh, boiled down to that would be a kind of informal language in a sense that as informal as you can get uh, so you would go for letters and try to find more uh, less formal letter types mm -hmm. and then instantaneous uh, quick like you need to uh, catch a bus and you need to type something very quickly and that's that is present so like um, in the middle ages they did quite often dictate to a scribe. So, for example, with Middle English, the Paston letters are kind of famous, and there's Margaret Paston because she's a female user, but she didn't know how to write herself. So she always had an amanuensis who took down from dictation. And there are a couple of letters where she wrote her name, like Margaret, and it's like Charles in writing because she didn't know how to write. So we tried to go as informal as we can get, and then uh, try to find text types like, um, well, uh, letters, but then also uh, court testimonies where someone gives a testimony in court and you have legal scribes taking it down from writing what they said that this would be kind of something which is copied on the spot by someone. Um, yeah, it's not a perfect match, but sort of the question is, yeah, if we want to uh, study these things, yeah, try to look for as good an approximation as possible. It would be very interesting to do it with a lot more text types. So it would have more formal emails, but those are actually kind of harder to come by. So there's like, there's the Endron corpus or so, which are because they're made public by court order, but uh, usually uh, some of them may be protected. And yeah, it would be interesting to do it more across the stage, but we wanted to look at some relatively recent uh, computer mediated communication and try to find as good approximation in the earlier text types as possible. Yeah. Um, it's, it's such a, such an interesting sweep um, across uh, across history. But I also have a question about the um, about the well, I guess it's also about comparability, but but um, the effect that you think the technology has on um, mm. on the abbreviation type and and the extent, um, because you mentioned the handwritten aspect of the earlier texts, and you also mentioned predictive texting, which mm. um, you know has uh, may have different effects for different people, um, and also even within the short history of, um, of computer-mediated communication, you know, it's changed a lot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what do you think, what, what, what do you think in your data is um, we see? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there is um, someone recently, they speak about trans-historical studies, which will be looking at uh, present day practices within the, um, a technological development because there's um, technology is not just the RTGL technology but writing technology and it will always have an effect. Um, yeah, try to take it into account. Yeah. <laughs> no questions? Yeah, I had a thank you. It's my turn. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I had a question, uh, maybe about the overarching or further goals or some insights you can, you know, get from your results. In particular, let's say um, the question of what, how do languages interact or the question of semantic transparency of people who know Latin while writing in English. 
much, right? Mm. And the productivity or something, or the French usage, which of course, you no know, English speakers knew French a long time ago. Now, you know, mm. yeah, no, no, not so much. So, in in terms of that, maybe you know, the productivity of particular schemas, let's call them all these, you know, abbreviations, when you have a multilingual, basically. Writer. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Can you maybe look use it to kind of explain maybe the mechanisms of semantic grammatical change going beyond abbreviations or at least on this particular data set? Um, it was uh, we looked at. I have some examples of productivity because there's some bonus slides, but um, this is what we found that with um, acronyms in present day English that it would not just be official acronyms, but you kind of find them spontaneously used. So these are some uh, SMSs from uh, 2017. And it says they're discussing going to uh, Camp and Furnace, which is apparently a nightclub. And it's twice referred to as Camp and Furnace, and then it gets abbreviated to CNF. So it's like that's a, a just kind of spontaneously perform acronyms, and then it's understandable uh, the lexeme from that. Uh, then there are some examples like um, uh, I've seen uh, in historical data, like there's the IE, one abbreviation, which in our text wasn't very common. Earlier, it's I, just standing for edest. And like I see, like there's some copies of the same text, and some of them abbreviated I. Like it is, and then one writes that is to say. So there's a question mm -hmm. if even if it's a multilingual abbreviation, it's not certain that when we see etc. Uh, when we see something like e.g., anyone actually parses it as the Latin in their head, or just the examples, and sort of barely spends any attention at all on it. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Now we have a lunch break, I think, and we can meet up half an hour. Yeah. Years ago, five Uh, I'm Ina Adamson. I'm from Tallinn University. I'm uh, working in the mm, Department of uh, Russian and East European Studies. And my topic today is uh, discourse of Russian language radio broadcast in Estonia, in the example of Radio Co, the official radio of Sto uh, Estonia. Uh, yes. <clears throat> no. oh, next slide. Why are you uh, have to selected this topic? <clears throat> My interest is connected with the Russian language in Estonia, and for a long time I, I collected uh, information about uh, language uh, specific of. Uh, Estonia, uh, Russian language specific in Estonia. And I made uh, some work version of um, uh, dictionary Esto uh, Estonian Russian, Venekelest Vibli, uh, because Vibli is now uh, for purchase. I made also in Blogspot the duplicated variant. Uh, it's connected with this topic. Uh, and uh, I had observing the peculiarities of the Russian language in Estonia uh, for 15 years now, uh, as well as Russian language usage outside, outside Russia. Uh, I have uh, published uh, some articles about this. Uh, they, they are also uh, in my website. Uh, you can see on my website. 
Yes. Uh, the pre pre history of the uh, before the radio. Uh, I focused the first uh, on uh, reading text, for example, Tallinn new city newspapers, uh, inform or information sheets distributed in city districts. Uh, and uh, uh, the, is, the findings uh, was essential to seek evidence which led to utilization of the Integrum uh, database system. Integrum helps me uh, make verification of these uh, language facts. Uh, this Integrum is a very interesting story because it was in uh, our national library. It was closed uh, after the starting of uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine war because uh, it's based on uh, Russian media resources. But uh, recently I was uh, uh, I was uh, in one conference, participated uh, at one conference uh, in England, <laughs> and uh, I meet, uh, met uh, the one person who deals with Integrum database. Uh, now that Integrum is uh, in America, but we can discover what is happening with this. In, in Helsinki, it's also possibly to use the database. It's very useful for research. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, this uh, database also helps to, helps to see how is uh, uh, used uh, the specific Russian language around the world, not only in Estonia, and spe specify what is only in Estonia, it's not Estonia. It's big, very big prehistory. Uh, this is described uh, the methodics what uh, have I used. Nikki uh, Takigawa methodics. Uh, now it's uh, maybe old because the 2008, uh, and, and etc. And I saw also facts uh, in Latvia, Germany, USA, China, Israel, etc. For example, Ida card. It's not not exist in Russian, for example. Absolutely. Uh, the second moment, um, uh, when we when we uh, when we uh, meet something uh, specific in Russian language uh, connected uh, outside of Russia, for, for example, from Est in Estonia, uh, I met uh, in text of Russian media uh, connected Fina Uric or business contexts, uh, the same nominations, not exist in Russian Russian. Uh, for example, the Levoish Rajdenia information hour. Uh, in September uh, 2022, we organized international seminar at our university, which was dedicated to addressing the challenge to, of establishing a corpus of the Russian language, the Baltic countries. The development now is stopped now. Uh, Baltic Scandinavia, Poland, and Germany, but maybe we can. Uh, develop the, this topic. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, uh, problem with the uh, uh, spoken language. This text is no problem. The spoken language is more problem. We can, for example, uh, take interviews with uh, Russian speak speaking persons. Um, our students can make interviews with uh, uh, school children, etc. But it, it's not enough. Uh, uh, okay, uh, examination of spon spontaneous speech in uh, media broadcast is very good opportunity to make uh, made research with uh, uh, this material. For example, I think so. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what about radio in Estonia? Uh, Russian language uh, radio in Estonia, there are seven channels uh, you can see on the slide. Um, uh, recently, I was discovered that uh, there is also a Christian radio channel. It's not very, not very popular. One of my students has told about this. This is only in Nava, but uh, the public is around the Europe. Very interesting fact. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, radio 4 is official uh, radio. Uh, parallel with Wiki Radio in Estonia, it's official, uh, like, first channel. Uh, uh, of Estonia. Also in Latvia is fourth channel, uh, Russian speaking official radio channel, for example. Yes, uh, Radio 4, uh, Radio 4, 
uh, the website. Uh, this this radio channel exists uh, more than 30, 31 years, uh, 1993 what was founded, because it was a frequency of uh, Soviet uh, channel Mayak. It's changed on this uh, channel. Before. Uh, we focus uh, on Radio 4 only because it's very much uh, speaking people, yes. Uh, especially guests uh, of channels, of translation, interviews, uh, and uh, conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. And diverse content, very important, very diverse content. The guest speech are quite detailed and uh, enable linguistic to be made. Not, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, like I have told, uh, Russian language discourse of Estonia uh, is is the first interest for this content. Uh, uh, in our focus is uh, Sergeyeva program. I choose why I choose this program because uh, uh, very uh, regularly uh, changed the. Uh, uh, guests gets a very range in diverse individuals. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, the program is publicly publicly presented as, as a discussion about the significant, the pricing, and the unclear. In general, without politics, uh, only human topics. Uh, guests uh, who were invited to the show are Specialists of the respective fields, highly or oh, highly experienced figures uh, within certain domains. Um, it's worth mentioning that within the speech of both guests, occasion as the presenters, I, I uh, research three uh, three programs of Sergeyeva. Uh, one program is one hour long, uh, three hours. Uh, uh, and conclusion was that uh, okay, it's very interesting for analyzing of discourse, discourse of Estonia, uh, Russian language in Estonia. Uh, here is described on this uh, next slide. Uh, this is one of our programs. Uh, th they were similarly analyzed, similar methods. Uh, uh, and additionally, the last 15 minutes program uh, typically designed for calls from radio listeners. Not regularly, but uh, sometimes it was. Uh, I, I have written that not always uh, the case. During this time, one still observes the speech patterns of the chorus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, as a presenter introduce the guests, the opportunity to research via Google, Google to learn more about these individuals who are there. Uh, such additional research uh, also enables us to identify the linguistic characteristic of the speaker's personalities. In particular, uh, the guests of the programs included individuals who had previously uh, pre pre resided in Russia. Or for instance, uh, another guest was uh, from Romania region, but reside in Estonia. Uh, that, that was a surprise also for me. <laughs> the selection of it was not uh, deliberate, rather the listening process unfolded sequ sequentially. It happened that you know, attention was drawn conversation with two different, uh, different uh, psychologists and traveler blogger. Psychologists were both women, uh, while the blogger was men. Uh, psychologists were uh, no middle age or elder women, women, and uh, blogger was uh, younger men. The programs were titled like you can see: love, addiction, budget, travel, and naval graphics. Uh, conclusions uh, drawn from the observation observations of these broadcasts. Uh, Thematic coherence was uh, maintained through vocabulary that aligned with corresponding semantic field. <clears throat> For instance, in case of psychology, the vocabulary used included the words separation, individualization, separation, individual, individualization, uh, suppress, uh, stand up, but <laughs> yeah, etc. Uh, Kaufman triangle, etc. 
the Baltic Islands. During the discussion uh, centered around travel, other uh, semantic field, uh, the screen billet, the low cost airport, and bay booking, hiking, etc. And also uh, a geographical place named uh, and names of nationalities, uh, Bergamo, uh, that, that um, signs on regularly. Uh, we have flights from Tallinn to Bergamo, operated by an air. Arland Airport near Tallinn, uh, Stockholm, etc., and Turkey. Uh, significant amount of colloquial vocabulary was observed uh, in all the dialogues listened to, including set phrases. Uh, a lot of the set phrases. It was very difficult to translate. <laughs> I also asked the uh, AI, chat GPT, but uh, <laughs> I can't translate these um, fragments. Uh, you can this, uh, see on the slide. Uh, they're very interesting because uh, there are many uh, new phraseologisms, active phraseologisms, uh, and uh, other types of words. Uh, other features, phonetics, uh, for example, stress. Uh, Say it uh, Bergamo, not Bergamo, normally, yes. Is uh, a report is a reporta, uh, normally is a reporta. Uh, error some very variable use of forms. Var report, var report, both forms was good. normal, uh, must be var report, sadu, skafu, etc. Yes, mesnik turkov is a mistake because it must be mesnik turok. Mm -hmm. And also estonisms, uh, edasi tagasi, leti, simini grach. Uh, maybe direct translation uh, of Estonian, maybe also from English. Karotki uh, variant приложение, short offer, баловая система. It's very, it's not very uh, normal for standard Russian, for example. Also, uh, a lot of Anglicism. Sudilathak, Sushi Shobrin, Chaitaram, and also uh, what likes uh, Russian to use, you know. In his speech, uh, with the quote quotes uh, from different sources, from films, from books, etc. So, Stalava Krugalubim Zelenim from old Soviet film, film before so Second World War. Uh, and uh, one meme that was uh, showed above. Uh, we uh, go to, uh, <laughs> to conclusions. conclusions. Uh, the, we observed uh, the positions in the radio transmission uh, here, three position or four position, radio show host, guest, listeners. Or second variant uh, with 15 minutes uh, of poll to the uh, radio host, uh, radio show host, guest, listeners, callers. And uh, general conclusion uh, about this case case studies. Mm -hmm. uh, the peculiarities of the speech of the guests of the programs depend of, of, uh, uh, on the linguistic personalities, how, uh, say, in Russian linguistics, for example. Um, and one conversation above love addiction was uh, by Russian language very pure, very pure. The other two conversations were uh, as features uh, uh, of colloquial speech. Uh, it does not possible to observe what is characteristic of the Russian language uh, uh, and influence of other languages. Uh, for, for greater ob objectivity in the future, it's planned to expand the repertoire of listens program, of course, uh, or uh, see other uh, corpuses uh, with uh, radio translations. <laughs> Broadcast. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. It's not quite about your research, as you mentioned that the political mm -hmm. topics were not included. Still, I would like to ask you this. Um, since the war in Ukraine started, uh, many people who understand or speak Russian have noticed that the Russian language with which I, I would call it an oppositional Russian language mm -hmm. 
has changed. For example, if you, if you say something happened mm -hmm. to Ukraine yeah, instead yeah. of now Ukraine, mm -hmm. Political. or when you put the stress in a different way, you say Ukrainsky instead of Ukrainsky. Mm -hmm. So this um, refers to the attitude. Oh. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, have you noticed these tendencies on Estonian and Russian? Yes, in other other broadcast words, Ukraine, but rather than now Ukraine. It was in other, not in this. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No questions. No discussion. After, after, well, maybe. Well, we, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, when you said the Love Addiction podcast, uh, sorry, not podcast, mm -hmm. show was the, uh, pure language. Yes. Um, you, do you mean that there weren't words from uh, from Estonian? No, no, weren't, weren't, yes. And, and but, but. Um, and do you also mean that the structure of the, mm -hmm. of, of the correct structures, correct language, was like. Regular. Mm -hmm. And so, where does that difference come from? Uh, I think the, uh, person, people, mm -hmm. the, the people, personal, that. personal uh, language culture. I think very good speech was. I yes. think so. Mm -hmm. Polsky calls it self management. Self management, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but but he speaks about language policy in general. But he says that language policy is not just something institutions and governments do. So people have their, you know, communities, families have their language policy, and so the language management, people have self-management. So how I, how would the host like to frame the, you know, who to speak, or how the guests uh, would like to speak to this particular audience, or how they speak in general? Yeah, so this is self-management. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you have the same host, is that right? The same host in mm -hmm. two different shows. So it'd be interesting to see so that three different shows. Three, three different. Three, three different shows. Mm -hmm. One was pure, a two was not pure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any, anything else? If no, thank you again. So we will wait for the next start on time because people might be changing uh, sections and so. We start at well twenty five minutes. So more break. Come on, let's just play. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. 
No, mis meil on kirjas niimoodi 14-50 juba järgmine kõnele jätta. Mul on arit vetiga ka paha. Viis minutit jätame küsimusteks. No üritan rohkem, et ei saa alati nii. No ütleme, et ma teeb viis minutit ja ei maksin viis. Meil on nagu üks minut aega veel. Ma arvutan, et meid on kaks kõik meil. Ei, ma tulen etsi küsimus. Ei, kõik peaks jooks, ma olen ühtes. Ei, ma teetse usu. Ma loodan, kui ei, siis ma kutsuma selle abilist või nii. So it's fourteen twenty-five. Let us go. Very nice presentations. The time flies. You don't notice. Yes. I want to make her mine on cell. Ei mina ei juhata, aga ma räägin seal üsna palju, nii et Antjaks juhatab. So you are chairing the next? Yeah, you remember that? It's 95, right? Yeah, well, I, yeah. Yeah, okay. I will leave it. So this is the program. We have this, vabandus, ma jooksen riigi. See oli seal, eks ole Gerasimen Koljaas, see on esimene. Ma tein, et kõik korraga lahti. Ma võid korraga lahti. Siis on Andra Kütt. Arvus Kütt Leegist ja siis on Vaks. Jah. How many have we have? So we have uh, three. Children with uh, an overkill. Yeah, yeah. You are tired of you have to clone yourself. That I just happened because I wanted to present one thing, my own presentation. Yeah. And then because we, well, we've done some, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we've done something on this Ukrainian, yeah. Estonian thing, and we had some. Well, your results. So, really, yeah. I decided that I would we could present it here. Yeah. Another thing is getting the Ukrainian thing, but in a different constellation. So, so Andra, there. Uh, so, so let's go. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. just want to take uh, yeah. one more picture here of this funny. Yeah. Yeah. Yes.
Oh. You're going to tell me this is it. Yes, this is it. Oh, oh, oh. Mm -hmm.
Yes, <laughs> Ma olen süsteemi näppimaks serveri ruum päev otsa heiretanud iga natukse ajada, et ma ootan, et ma saan põhjalik sellega juttu peale. Kõik ettekandud on praegu seal ees lahti. Üks on PDF kontrol L on, et ma hätab teise kaare resiimi. Ootan, probaat või kui sa ei teadud. Muutus ei ole. Kas mina pean midagi tegema, siis kui ma alustan? Mul on see oma isitlus sinne ees, seda ma nagu siis näitan kõigile, aga kas ma pean nagu zoomis ka midagi teha? Ma võin tulla need tehnilised asjad ikka ära teha. Siis on ette. Võindugus tulevu. Võindugus olles tulevu. Mina võtlesin, mina võtlesin. Jah, jah, ma sain aru. Jah, 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 Yeah, we decided that it's a little bit easier, maybe. And also on a lot to do today. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, afternoon session, and uh, we have four authors today, and it's going to be a not a one woman show, but Olga is presenting um, the first song. <laughs> yes. Um, I will be presenting the talk, and I'm very glad that two of my co authors are in the audience. Uh, my freak from the University of Oulu and Anna Versik from Tallinn University. And Jan Kaplanov uh, from Kiev National Linguistic University is in Oulu right now. So uh, we have quite a diverse academic background. 
for this talk. And um, as we all know, the ongoing Russian attack on Ukraine that started in 2022 has led to the displacement of millions of people worldwide, and especially in Europe. And even prior to the active phase of war, the language situation in Ukraine was more complex than just Russian and just Ukrainian. Uh, and the varieties of Ukrainian and Russian used in the country are not clear cut. And a number of transitional varieties exist. Many of you uh, know the term Suzhik. Uh, and uh, Suzhik is uh, that a lot of people say we use, but it's not actually uniform. It can vary, vary um, uh, depending uh, on the area in the country. And the speaker's language use may be very flexible, gliding between the varieties, sounding more Ukrainian, more Russian, and the changes in the family constellations and communities with uh, the dis displacement caused by the war have contributed to this complexity even more. So we were interested to look at the language switching in the conversation through participants' perspective and microanalytic approach, paying attention to the question, uh, what language choices do conversation participants make? And how are their language choices and switches between languages organized on the level? Seeing the first slide is correct. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, um, a little bit uh, of uh, background for Ukrainian and uh, uh, the language situation in Ukraine that has spread over uh, to the places where Ukrainian people ended up. In the Soviet time, Russian was de facto the official language in Ukraine. And uh, unfortunately, a stereotype of Ukrainian as a language of unsophisticated peasants prevailed, became partly internalized, because the times of modernization and urbanization coincided with Russification. And uh, um, it caused uh, some Ukrainians to shift to Russian. Um, and uh, for a large part of Ukrainian speakers, the complete shift in Soviet times was not necessary because they were able to communicate in an in-between variety that has the folk name Surzhik. Uh, but Surzhik was and still is considered as a low prestige variety, both by the speakers of standard Russian and by those who have been striving to preserve Ukrainian as a language of high culture, despite Russification. At the same time, scholars started paying closer attention to Surzhik, which um, has been fulfilling functions of the urban vernacular. And although Surjik has become a stabilized variety, it is not uniform across Ukraine. What you may call classical Surjik is stable, maybe described as a fused lact. Its phonology and inflectional morphology are mainly Ukrainian, and the lexicon can be both Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, there is a continuum of uh, multipodalism, as Hanschel and Taranenko call it, because most of the speakers in Central and Eastern Ukraine use multiple codes, variety of expressions, Ukrainian and Surzhik, where Surzhik is a primary code for many. And people learn to distinguish between Russian, Ukrainian, and Surzhik at school, where the official languages, official languages varieties are taught. And in any case, at times it is impossible to ascribe a particular element to a particular variety, because in addition to closely related Russian and Ukrainian varieties and Surzhik, code switching between those varieties may also occur. And to make the story even more complicated, Russian spoken in Ukraine may vary from the local variety of standard to heavily Ukrainianized versions with Ukrainian phonology and some Ukrainian lexicon. And since 2014, um, the Russian language and Russian ethnicity is becoming less and less relevant for uh, identity uh, of people in Ukraine, as demonstrated uh, by Ukrainian service by Kulik, who describes the process as bottom-up derasification. And a recent survey by the Kiev International Institute of Psycho uh, Sociology um, in December 2022 addressed the topic of language usage in everyday life. And according to the study, significantly more respondents since uh, 2017 uh, have reported that they use Ukrainian only and mostly Ukrainian, and the rate has been up to 5%. And significantly less respondents uh, now use Russian only or mostly Russian, and the fall is... Uh, even bigger, up to 6%, with just some years. A clear shift in attitudes and uh, growing identification with Ukrainian is evident. And um, inhabitants of Ukraine, regardless of ethnicity and linguistic background, are increasingly breaking out from uh, the so-called Russian language empire. Uh, and at the same time, a language 
linguistic complexity that has emerged due to the context between closely related related varieties, which were referred um, historically as the East Slavic continuum and as multipodalism again, remains a fact of everyday interaction for most Ukrainians. And uh, speaking about Finnish situation, Finland has a population of uh, approximately 5.6 million. And the majority of people, of course, speak um, um, Finnish as a native language. And the other national language, Swedish, is spoken by 5% of the population. And the largest minority language, Russian, is spoken by 1.7%. Uh, other large minority languages include Estonian and Arabic, which are both slightly less than 1% of the population. Uh, and uh, if we compare indigenous Sami languages, they are unfortunately 20 to 25 times less widespread than Estonian and Arabic. And Ukrainians uh, are estimated to have become the fourth or the fifth largest language group in Finland uh, just during one year of uh, 2022, uh, which uh, showed a significant increase in the number of Ukrainians from 7,000 uh, to 50,000 in just a year. And similarly to Ukrainians in Ukraine, Ukrainians in Finland show a tendency towards reverse language shift, towards using more Ukrainian, less Russian, um, and uh, other more related changes in language attitudes. And uh, in a survey conducted by our colleagues, uh, my freak and Janka Pranov, um, in 2023, uh, by approximately 1,500 Ukrainians, 96% of all the respondents uh, use Ukrainian in Finland, at least sometimes. And this percentage is higher than uh, uh, the percentage of native Ukrainian and bilingual speakers, meaning that uh, also native Russian speakers who have come from Ukraine also use Ukrainian in some domains. Uh, and the respondents report uh, wanting to use even more Ukrainian than before and are worried about the possibilities of maintaining the Ukrainian language and culture in Finland. And attitudes towards Sufric vary from full acceptance and partial acceptance to rather negative attitudes based, again, um, in uh, the uh, in the view of Sufric being less than official languages. So um, as uh, our perspective is microanalytic, we selected a single family of four adult members. And for this presentation, we will focus on two of them, Panas and Natalia, who have uh, lived in Finland uh, for many years. Um, and uh, to see uh, how um, they talk about their language use, we have conducted uh, language sociological interviews. Uh, the participants were interviewed at the home, and uh, the interviews were based on uh, questions concerning their linguistic life stories, language attitudes, and experiences of language usage situations. Panas was born in 1990s to a Central Europe Ukrainian family who mainly spoke Ukrainian and some Sufric. He studied Russian from grade one, and he describes himself as fluent in both Ukrainian and Russian. In the interview, he tells about his conscious choice not to use Russian after having read news about the Bucha massacres in the spring of 2022. And having started to use Ukrainian even when speaking to ethnic Russians at his work or free time. And Panas's attitude towards Sufric is tolerant, but only when it is used as a stepping stone toward monolingual Ukrainian. Panas and Natalia tell that they have started dating approximately six years before the interview. And then they spoke Russian uh, between the two of them, but soon Panas switched to speaking Ukrainian and started encouraging Natalia to speak Ukrainian as well. Natalia, who is also born in the 1990s, uh, her childhood family spoke Russian at home, but Ukrainian was the language of tuition in school. And uh, uh, she describes her hometown uh, in uh, northeastern Ukraine as Russian speaking. Uh, Surzhik was used, but more and more Ukrainian is used nowadays. And she uh, describes Ukrainian as a language that she has a strong emotional connection to, uh, while her relation to Russian is more practical. Uh, Natalia says uh, she has begun to consciously speak uh, more Ukrainian and less Russian. And she says uh, that um, uh, she sends messages in Ukrainian, even though she might use uh, Russian talking um, to the same people. Uh, and um, um, 
she um, had uh, to uh, learn more Ukrainian. She has noticed improvement in her spoken Ukrainian. She spoke more and more of it. Uh, but she describes that she easily slips to Surzik when she is attempting to speak either Russian or Ukrainian. Uh, she challenges the idea that Surzik is not rich, claiming that her language, is, her language use is rich, even though it is mostly Surzik. Um, so as you can see, um, um, the data uh, consists of interviews and face-to-face uh, -face interactions. And uh, the interviews uh, tell us about the participants' language attitudes and linguistic differences. But of course, the responses may also strongly reflect what the interviewees conceive to be the correct answer, what is expected of them, or what they would like their language use to be. And uh, therefore, we found it important to set up a recording of everyday interaction at the participants' home. Um, and um, um, the face-to-face -face interaction, you can see it's uh, almost uh, 20 hours of it recorded, but we have uh, focused on two hours uh, of the video recordings for the market analysis. Um, and we uh, have analyzed both how people talk about their family language policies and how they act them out in real life situations. The recordings were done before the interviews and the participants were instructed to act naturally as they would without the camera, uh, with researchers not present. Uh, and in the analysis, we have relied on the regularities of turn taking, and we have taken uh, into account the sequence organization. Um, and our um, study shows that each of the family members presents a personal style in language choices, presenting a decline from more or less monolingual Ukrainian through language mixing, Surzik, to original variety of monolingual Russian. And regardless of the different multilingual communication strategies and family members' different language attitudes, the recordings of everyday conversations show a very little orientation to language issues. Panas mostly sticks to his personal language variety while speaking, and Natalia usually switches between language varieties depending on the addresses of her talk. Um, so uh, when she speaks to her mom and grandma, who are not present in this presentation, she mostly uses Russian or Surzik, and um, uh, she uses like more uh, Ukrainian data to include everyone, uh, especially using ritualistic um, uh, formulas. But in this presentation, in those excerpts uh, chosen, she only addresses Panas, with whom she usually speaks Ukrainian or Surzik. Um, and uh, in the following excerpts, you can see more helpless attempts to color the language usage. And you are very welcome to contact me whenever you see fit, uh, because of course it's it's very hard to simplify. But I was thinking that uh, for the people who do not read Cyrillic, it can be kind of easier to see um, <laughs> at least the attempts to color the languages. Uh, here, Panas and Natalia are speaking about a local activity where um, two Ukrainian families with children are needed to take part in, and Ukrainian is colored blue. On the first slide, Panas is reminding Natalia in Ukrainian. Listen, Natalia, we need a family. And he instantly repairs himself, two families. You do remember, don't you? And in this excerpt, Natalia, who usually addresses Panas in Ukrainian, replies to his request in Russian, asking for the age of children. Panas is answering in Ukrainian, given the age. Until 30 years, 13 years, so the children would speak already. 13 years maximum. Natalia asks again in Russian for the conditions set at the families. Well, um, it is needed that there are several children in the family. Uh, and it's in full Russian again. Panas responds in Ukrainian. The main thing is two families, so that there are mother and father, and so on. Um, and then uh, he's uh, starting to reason that is for no, for instance. Natalia initiates a repair in which she's recycling Panas's words. And she does it in Ukrainian. And if there is no father. Panas is given a response in Ukrainian. Then, if the father is not here or has not come yet, it is enough if the mother and the children take part. And even though the structure of the Natalia's utterance is um, sequentially the same, with every turn, she initiates a condition clarification. Okay, we need two families. What is the age of children? Should there be multiple children? What if there is no father? She switches swiftly to Ukrainian. When she recycles Panas's words, even though the rest of her speech is discordant with Panas's speech, 
um, in the language choice, but here it would be, you know, maybe rude to kind of to recycle and to translate it to another language. Mm -hmm. The next excerpt is uh, directly following the previous one. Natalia is repeating her question in Russian again. How old should the children be? Panos, who has already answered, is asking her, are you kidding? And adding a mild curse. When Natalia, with a smile, explains in Russian again, well, I have missed it. Um, and this utterance could be in Ukrainian, but she pronounces it the Russian way. Propustila, uh, not propustila. Panasis agitatedly uh, moving away. And uh, after a pause, he starts to tell, um, well, I will tell you tomorrow. So think now. And here, Natalia switches for Ukrainian, asking him about the age requirements for children in Ukrainian now. Again, Panos does not answer, starting with a suggestion for Natalia to think, and Natalia repeats her question in Ukrainian in the last line, adding to it the affectionate nickname for Panos, Kitsa, uh, which is in Ukrainian, and an intensifier, Butlaska, literally be kind, uh, please, and a question again in full Ukrainian. So she un intensifies her question for the information she's not getting, and she is sticking to Ukrainian, um, when her Russian nu ya propustila does not grant her an answer. Uh, it is not the topic of this presentation, but it may be interesting that Panas has a possibly surgic originated dialect particle ot in his speech on the line level. And um, uh, I'm omitting the lines where Panas has finally repeated the age requirements for Natalia. And here uh, on uh, the first line on line 24, Natalia is already thinking of the families she could invite. She names a family in Ukrainian, Nauminka, one family, and Panas brings up there are actually two families needed and asks Natalia to deal with this issue. Um, so possibly not just name the families, but also to discuss uh, the issue with the families. And as Natalia starts thinking about the interaction with uh, Nauminka family she named, she switches to Russian and um, um, either surgic original Russian with repeated shows, which are not Ukrainian. And when she explains to Panas, she can't just approach people and say, I need you, grab the children, come here and there. She asks that Panas explain this moment to her, and by the end of her utterance, she's speaking Russian. Panas replies with a dialect particle, uh, or maybe a verb, look, in Ukrainian. And Natalia responds, I'm looking, in Ukrainian. And later, Panas proceeds with the explanation, what is the activity for the families? And the most interesting uh, example, uh, where again, some lines are omitted. Uh, now, Panas is forming request for Natalia to call somebody, uh, he forgot exactly whom, and to ask more precisely what is needed from the families. And Natalia is responding with a suggestion that is very formal, obviously jokingly formal. She's smiling and she uses a plural indicative form to underline the formality. Send me the contacts on Monday from eight to four and I will get in contact during my working time. Panais tries to tell something in a short pause between Natalia's turns, starting with well, but abandons the turn, lets Natalia finish, and he reacts to her suggestion with a turn where he uses a derogatory term for a Russian woman, Hatsapka. And Natalia reacts to it with a Russian sentence, but she inserts a Ukrainian nickname, Kitsa, in response to Panais's spoken, her national identity. Um, and uh, the example continues, Panas is changing the topic, and asking Natalia, uh, will she eat a candy? And she's responding with a negative focalization that is not linguistically marked. Panas changes the topic again, asks about how much time has been recorded on video. And Natalia responds in Russian, but this time she inserts Ukrainian or possibly surgical she. So she reacts to Panas' spoken with minimal insertions of Ukrainian into her predominantly Russian talk. But it is enough. Uh, she's not switching to Ukrainian fully. But even those insertions are enough to lessen the language discordance that Panas is pointing out with his joking insult, Katsapka. So, yeah, um, I will leave the conclusions on. Sorry, I have uh, run over time. And uh, your questions and comments are very welcome. Thank you. We have some time for well, actually, I'm sorry, it's a comment, not oh, yeah. a question, because I'm one of the others. So, uh, uh, ask somebody to transcribe. The person who transcribed is not a linguist. And I was against transcribing it 
in Cyrillic, not because something is wrong with Cyrillic per se, mm -hmm. but you end up transcribing in standard Russian and standard Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And so what if there is, well, the Surgic case, what if it is uh, Russian lexically, but Ukrainian phonology? So this is, this is partly because of this reason it was difficult to, well, sometimes we succeeded in coloring it uh, with different colors, marking it with different colors. But uh, I mean, well, uh, well, we debated a lot about this, but uh, yeah, so because sometimes you cannot guess what it is from two standard orthographies. And of course, we ourselves are not um, blank as well. Because when we've been talking uh, with Jan, um, Jan uh, um, mostly speaks Ukrainian in his everyday life. And he was seen Ukrainian, where I, who I mostly speak Russian in my everyday life, I was seen Russian, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> uh, and there's some debatable things that the purists say they should not be in Ukrainian, but people use them. So mm -hmm. Ukrainian speakers, so yeah. Any other questions? I'm curious about You said there was there was code switching between the three varieties, but um, what does that mean if Surjik is already you know a mixture of the two? Languages. What does it mean to have code switching from Russian and Ukrainian in the Surzik? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I would pose it to Anna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I I, under, I, I, I can see uh, where well well have you uh, encountered uh, well any let's say Tallinn Finnish kind of, you know, when Estonians attempt to speak Finnish. Mm -hmm. so it may be, so there are chunks that are well, more Finnish and there are chunks that are more Estonian and there are chunks that, well, exactly the same thing, using lexicon of one language, but more percentage so from another. But differently from the Stalin Finnish, uh, Surzik is described in the literature, now it's abused in a Peter Auer's terms, abused lect. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, something like ra random mixture, but uh, there are certain characteristics. So, so phonology is mainly Ukrainian. So this is the key. Mm -hmm. Lexicon can be both. Mm -hmm. um, inflections, mostly Ukrainian. And so, so in some cases, it's clear surgic. In some cases, just ambiguous. Yeah. So some cases you have, uh, you see a switching. I can give you a literature. So with example, mm -hmm. so it's in English. It's not in surgic. <laughs> yeah, but so can, if you are interested, because yeah, mm -hmm. we had to study this question. You know, we had to study because because you you cannot analyze otherwise. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but speaking very uh, generally, maybe uh, it can be uh, explained through construction grammar. So kind of there are some chunks of Surik, which are, uh, you know, widespread and which are like mostly used and maybe some formula expressions. And then is definitely, you know, switching from Surik to other varieties and Surik again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. With me, yeah. So, so. So now you we again. We will pass. We will try here. All right. Wonderful. What a wonderful lineup here. Um, so um, our next talk is on new bilingualism. Um, so I have no idea who starts. 
Well, um, are you in the order? <laughs> yeah, well, we know who speaks what. So thank you. We are talking about Ukrainian again, but this time in Estonia, in the whole research and the situation is quite different. So this is what we have since 2022. The number of ethnic Ukrainians uh, in Estonia has grown. And especially when we are talking about refugees, so uh, 50,000 is a population of a big Estonian city. So it's quite considerable for a country such as Estonia. So, uh, of course, uh, there is uh, some old, well, let's say old timers, Ukrainians. Some of them are Estonian, Ukrainian bilinguals. But... Um, now we are going to talk about this completely new bilingual and because these people who came, of course, they hadn't had any contact with Estonian. They haven't been, you know, a part of our educational system. And so uh, we are interested in how Ukrainian children acquire Estonian at various schools. Uh, so... Um, uh, we are concentrating on Baba um, Dosekol, it's a freedom school, and it was established in 2022, especially for Ukrainian refugee uh, refugees children here in Tallinn. And immersion, for those of you who don't know the Estonian context, immersion uh, schools are quite popular in Estonia. And uh, this school is using uh, late immersion because the children are from grade seven to 12. So not the very beginners, not the first graders. And it's late partial immersion. So 60% of the subjects are being taught in Estonian and 40 in Ukrainian. So the teachers who are teaching Ukrainian, there are uh, teachers who came, well, who are refugees and so. Uh, so the aim of uh, our uh, research, not this slide, but yes, uh, is to analyze uh, students' narratives in Ukrainian and uh, in Estonian. And uh, I must say that they have uh, learned Estonian only less than two years. And um, we focused on narrative skills because um, the narrative skills or storytelling are um, the most general language skill, so we can assume uh, that uh, good narrative skills in L1 uh, can affect positively uh, other languages uh, use and narrative skills. And uh, in addition, we analyze also children's um, lexicon and also narrative comprehensions, how many goals, attempts, etc. there are in, in narratives. Uh, we use uh, this um, multilingual assessments of narrative uh, narratives uh, methods, and um, this uh, test based on uh, six uh, pictures and uh, two different testers. I and Anna <laughs> conducted the test uh, in two different stories, and uh, based on these uh, six pictures, uh, student um, can create her own story. And um, we determined uh, the story according to the mind standards protocol and give points uh, from uh, this comprehension and also uh, lexicon uh, uh, according to the mind protocol. Yes. <laughs> so uh, home languages. So we well, one thing we changed. We changed this uh, mine standard uh, questionnaire because uh, you know there is no point in asking mother tongue, especially in the case of Ukraine. So we asked for home language, home languages, and so uh, we had fifteen children. So seven indicated Ukrainian, two indicated Russian, three Ukrainian, Russian, three Russian, Ukrainian. We don't know whether it is just convenience or 
uh, one of the, the language uh, that is marked as the first one is dominant, we don't know, and one unknown that probably forgot it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know, uh, yeah, uh, whether it is a projection, wishful thinking, or this corresponds to real um, uh, usage. So this is, is it an act of identity or, uh, or, or not only it. So uh, of uh, the 15 children, only one wanted to switch to Russian. So uh, others all spoke Ukrainian, so regardless of what language was marked as the home language or languages. So when we see the results, then uh, we see that the uh, home language does not necessarily uh, predict uh, richness or complexity of the narrative. And uh, the two first children, they got zero points from Estonian because um, in their narratives, there are no goals, no attempts, and so cetera. And um, we also see that uh, good narrative skills in uh, L1 in, Ukra in Ukrainian uh, does not predict uh, uh, good results in Estonian. But if uh, our sample size is bigger, Two children bigger than bigger than two children, then we see that uh, statistically difference, and uh, Ukraine, and we can assume that L one um, gives some good uh, results to Estonian narratives. Uh, when we see the comprehensions, uh, then the picture is different. Uh, there are quite uh, good results in Estonian, and uh, it, it says that uh, they have some passive knowledge of Estonian. And uh, we can say that the picture is understood, but they don't have uh, linguistic tools to answer the questions. And uh, we also contact that them. Um, uh, adjectives and also the words uh, which they can use uh, to um, feelings and um, um, emotional uh, words that uh, they got uh, many children got uh, zero points uh, especially the verb uh, tundma uh, to feel and uh, so we see that they lost these points Mm -hmm. ah, so you have heard a lot about Zurich already, so it was actually the was very nice that the first presentation was scheduled just before this. So uh, I will not go into details uh, what Zurich is, but um, so so one of the uh, children uh, was quite shy, so well, actually I speak Zurich, so well, Zurich is Zurich, fine, I don't care, so, but actually, yeah. Actually, she had only one uh, word that could be qualified as Surgic. So, uh, uh, so it is a fused lect. Uh, yeah, so we would say the, the pattern is a Ukrainian phonology and most of inflection and morphology lexicon can be uh, uh, more or less more Russian. So, uh, so this uh, actually this word uh, she used in uh, Surzik was well, quite sophisticated. Well, uh, she was talking well about um, nerve ending. So it's nervovi zakinchenya in Ukrainian. And she said okonchanya. So akonchanya, it's in Russian, okonchanya. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, uh, the standard method in, well, you know, my, so we look for various parts of speech, so, so many nouns, so many this, so many that, and, well, foreign language items. And here comes the problem because it's difficult, you know, closely related varieties. Uh, is difficult, so should we classify according to standard Ukrainian or not? Probably not, I would say. 
just so uh, we didn't mark what was clearly surgic, we didn't mark as foreign. And I was just, was just uh, uh, marked with a different color. What was clearly Russian, there was a couple of words, so it was Russian, but still. For example, what was interesting is gender assignment, of course. So the word sabaka uh, in Ukrainian, sobaka in standard Ukrainian, it is masculine. In Russian, it is feminine. So all children who talked about um, a dog, that dog in the story, they uh, used either pes, well, which is clearly masculine, no problem. Yeah. You know? And the cognate in Russian is masculine, but they, then they use sabaka, eh, sobaka, and it was, uh, it was feminine. Then other things when you cannot use this uh, approach is the interesting thing: there were uh, there were birds in this story, birds and um, uh, little birds. So uh, the child uses the so the klub. So, which is Russian, standard Russian for uh, beak, uh, because standard Ukrainian is a job. But, but we cannot decide, you know, we go according to the pronunciation, because this child would probably speak Russian, monolingual Russian, also with a Ukrainian accent. And there is no way, it's not a, such a word that we can say, well, uh, it's so, so usual, so frequent, it is used in Ukrainian, so let's count it as Sujik or Ukrainian. But when this child used the plural, Kluviki, little beaks, kluviki, not kluviki, kluviki, which is clearly Ukrainian phonology. So is it surgic? So I think that actually uh, an analysis uh, on the close level would be better, but well, we were counting parts of speech here. So there, there, there might be some questionable decisions, I'm warning. Um, uh -uh, that's 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 yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> uh, differences between the narratives in Ukrainian. Um, so there were children who had very uh, small number, the lowest number of tokens, 72, 173 types. And the highest is, you see the difference, 179 and 458 types. Uh, well, another th limitation is that these children are slightly older than uh, mine, a uh, protocol prescribes. So formally speaking, they get zero points for understanding because they didn't give an answer that would be expected, you know, for, for according to the mine protocol. But they they are grown ups, so they the problem was um, well there was a story about birds. So mother bird flew away to get some food, and then a bad cat came up and wanted to eat uh, the little birds. And then the dog came came and pulled the cat by the tail and rescued yes those little birds. And what would mother bird say? if she would, well, what would she think about the cat and the dog, something like that. Highly speculative question. And so, and this was kind of, uh, well, out of place for these children because they are uh, older. And so and they had adult-like formulations. For example, one girl answered, I don't have an exact solution for this problem. Now, describe, yeah describing this um, mother bird's attitudes or uh, adult like formulations like aggressive or in the uh, allegorical so these children come from the war mm -hmm. situation so uh one child said well this is a well this is like war kind of situation allegorical in the biological sense so this is why uh, these uh, figures about understanding, uh, they they don't give the exactly right picture. So, what is <laughs> landmark and the distribution between the parts of speech in both languages? You can see a very beautiful picture, I think, here, and not so beautiful over there. So. You can see a system in the Ukrainian language narratives. They don't have 
very many nouns. It's interesting, actually, it is interesting that they have quite a lot of uh, verbs in their stories. Uh, quite a lot adjectives also. But what you can see here is that the differences between children are quite small. This is a quite systematic distribution. But this is a bit blurry, I think. You can see the gray here. The gray means that the children use another uh, words from another language. They usually use them English. What is interesting, maybe because they knew that Andra is not speaking Ukrainian and they opt for, for English, sometimes uh, some Russian words also. But you can see that there are not so many other lemmas at all here. And still, this um, quite big amount of verbs can be observed here also. So, and looking at the, uh, the variety or amount of uh, lexicon in two languages, the blue one is for Ukrainian and the red one is for Estonian, we can see that, um, of course, the vocabulary in first language is quite, quite weak, but quite small in Estonian. And um, it was from 10 to, to 44 lemmas in Estonian. So what we wanted to know was that is there a correlation between the amount of vocabulary used in these narrations between two languages? And actually uh, it was, but statistically not so, so significant if we just um, just try to, to calculate this, the same data with the two other average children, plus, plus two average children, we would have got the uh, significant difference, but we didn't. But Estonian uh, stories were, were very, how to say, pure. Children's Estonian skills are not quite good and uh, they are, were not um, like coherent uh, narrations, but uh, but rather descriptions or even naming, just naming some objects on the pictures. And yes, you can see here a lot of um, interesting examples of code switching, uh, etc. For example, I like this. No rebane walk yarven. Because just they used all all language capacity they had at this moment. So as a, the conclusion, I could say that, um, that although we didn't find a clear uh, correlation between uh, children's uh, narrations in narratives in uh, Ukrainian and Estonian, our data actually was close to this correlation. So maybe, maybe just we had more children, we had this different, uh, this significant difference. And of course, uh, we actually can't compare these uh, narratives because, uh, very well, because uh, they have so uh, small um, capacity to, to, to narrate in Estonia. So children still have uh, quite good comprehension of Estonian because uh, the score of comprehension part was, was very good. Some points, some children even manage to do better than in Ukrainian. And, um, and when we thought uh, about the reasons why, why these scores were even higher than in Ukrainian stories, it could be that uh, the whole procedure was already familiar because uh, the Ukrainian test was the first one. And after that, Estonian test was conducted. So they already knew the procedure. Another thing was that uh, they didn't um, 
they understood better the procedure and the goal, maybe, because they didn't uh, overthink yeah, about the different uh, word things. So we had several very interesting things. We think that we have to continue to investigate, uh, for example, why the amount of verbs is so big in Ukrainian sample, because we haven't had such results before in Estonian. So it is interesting. And uh, also what is interesting is uh, this, oh, these different um, home languages and different uh, mm, uh, related varieties in narratives and their, their balance. And uh, we thought that maybe, maybe it isn't good to use this test with children whose, whose language, Estonian language skills are not so pure. But maybe some other test would be better. But the, the goal was not to assess children's linguistic skills. It was just to compare. So maybe if we will continue and make the same test after one year, maybe the results would be different. Thank you. Uh, do you think you would get the same results if if you let the or encourage the children to use their home language, whether it was Russian or Ukrainian, or or to use Sorzhik and, and sort of encourage them to not to stick to pure Ukrainian? Because if if they're instructed to speak Ukrainian, they might be very comfortable in the states they might be making as well. So if, if they speak Russian at home, not Sorzhik as well. Was not a problem. So one child started in Ukrainian, and that I thought that might be a problem. So, well, if you want to speak Russian, then speak Russian. So then he switched to Russian. Otherwise, I think they were quite fluent. So they were, I don't know. I said, I, I think I said in the beginning that if you want to switch to Russian, mm -hmm. this is for, no, they all uh, spoke Ukrainian, and there was no problem of fluency. So they told a coherent story, I think, more or less, but there was coherence that you don't find in the story. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? It was not part of your survey, but uh, what compensation strategies do we use most if we didn't know what, how to say? In some cases, no, Russian, Russian. Uh, Ukrainian also. No avoidance, no some credit. No, but it's a very, uh, it's like very straightforward. It was very, so you have to answer a particular question. So it's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the narrations also, mm -hmm. they opt for uh, for English. And for Russian, and sometimes there was some some Ukrainian, Ukrainian, Ukrainian chunks. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, compensation now, I think they don't have so so much mm -hmm. Estonia to to use the strategy. I think so. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Do you know if uh, if there have been similar settings with other language versions of the name? Like, could it be because of Cultural differences in the narrative tradition, like are some languages more prone to use specific words? But I mean the story, you see, the logic of the story. So something happens, the bird flies away, the cat comes up, the cat does this and that, then the dog comes out. Oh, and so, so it's action, actually. So I don't know. In Estonia, they maybe they didn't have. They didn't have, yes. They didn't have. It's not that there are no, it, it is not that Estonian narratives have uh, less verbs per se, but in their Estonian narratives. Yeah. But we don't have a word. They exactly the similar data from mm -hmm. other languages, only for Estonian. And uh, uh, children in Estonian 
uh, data set were quite young, I think, seven or to mm -hmm. ten. Mm -hmm. It's a different so test, different ten. test, but it's still the mother tongue, you know, first language mm -hmm. speakers. But there were much less verbs than here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have between the uh, well, because um, what is the definition? Yeah, so we can ask how that is. So that they can learn, you have like two weeks leads, break, yeah, 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 yeah
Um, and there's no uh, like one concentrated or several concentrated uh, of Estonians in Norway, but they're rather spread out uh, all over the country. Uh, and the type of Estonians that I am dealing with in my sample are young families uh, that raise their children in Norway. Uh, and all of the children uh, are either already born in Norway or they moved there before preschool. Uh, and the questions that I'm uh, giving a little uh, overview in very broad strokes uh, today. Uh, first of all, what's the relationship between exposure quantity and exposure quality, uh, both language internally and across languages? Uh, and also, what's the re relationship between language exposure and their Estonian competence? Again, uh, Estonian exposure and Estonian competence, but also Norwegian exposure and Norwegian competence. Uh, to uh, operationalize language competence, I'm using results from two language tests. Uh, they are both developed within the Litmus toolkit, uh, so they are available in both Estonian and Norwegian, uh, which was important to make the results somewhat uh, comparable. Uh, first, the sentence repetition task uh, is very <laughs> straightforward. Uh, it is what it sounds like. Uh, the child hears the sentence and then they have to repeat it as precisely as they can, as they remember. Uh, and since the sentences are made sure to be long enough not to rely on just phonetic memory, uh, this type of task taps into the language processing abilities, uh, but also grammatical knowledge. Uh, because in order to repeat something, you have to be able to process, so you have to know the construction. Uh, and then also uh, cross-linguistic lexical tasks, uh, which is a vocabulary test. Uh, in four subtests, it tests uh, noun and verb uh, production and comprehension. It's a very simple picture-based task with either one picture for production tasks uh, or four pictures that the child has to choose from for the comprehension tasks. Oh, sorry. Uh, and for language exposure, I had the parrots or fill out or rather filled out together with them. Um, a language questionnaire it is web based and it is customizable. Uh, and there the parents could indicate uh, who speaks what language to the child and like in what relation, like how much do you speak Estonian, how much do you speak Norwegian, how much time do children then spend with these different speakers, different groups like teachers or friends, uh, and how often the child reads uh, or is read to or watches TV or plays with friends or goes to any extracurricular activities uh, in uh, both of the languages. Uh, and from these answers, uh, I, had, I got three different measures that I use today. Uh, current language exposure, which is uh, the amount of or the estimate of hours per the last year that the child uh, was in an Estonian environment uh, or a Norwegian one. Then the cumulative language exposure, which is an estimate of the number of months over the child's lifespan. Uh, and then a richness score, which I use as the indicator for quality, uh, which is an index um, comprised of these frequency estimates of how often the child reads, how often the child watches TV, and so on, uh, as well as the number of different speakers that the child hears this language from, and also an estimate of how proficient these speakers are. Uh, and my sample so far uh, consists of 23 ch children, uh, and most of them are a part of this um, diaspora community in Norway. Uh, but I do have some children that live in Estonia, so I brought them out separately here because um, their uh, language profiles look quite different uh, because of this difference. Um, my, my sample is between five and seven years of age, and the uh, average age is exactly in the middle, six years and six months. Uh, and I have uh, roughly uh, roughly balanced numbers of uh, boys and girls. 
Uh, now, looking at the language competence measures, uh, in all these charts, the light green uh, bars uh, stand for uh, children that live in Norway. Uh, the purple bars represent kids that live in Estonia, and then the blue one is the average across the whole sample. Uh, and as you can see, the Estonian measures on the left side here, the, uh, the part of the sample that lives in Estonia outperforms everyone else, uh, as might be expected, um, and their Norwegian results are somewhat uh, uh, lower. Uh, whereas uh, for Norwegian tests, uh, again, we see that the kids living in Estonia score somewhat lower, but the differences are much smaller. So for the Norwegian tests, uh, both groups scored quite similarly. Uh, moving on to exposure data, uh, we kind of see a similar pattern. Uh, the, the sample that lives in Estonia, uh, which is up here, uh, so current exposure is an estimate of the past year, and we see that most of their language exposure is in Estonian, uh, which is expected. Uh, however, uh, the sample that lives in Norway uh, gets an equal amount of exposure in the two languages, which is somewhat surprising considering that they go to school in Norwegian, most of their friends in the neighborhoods usually speak Norwegian. Uh, but nevertheless, the uh, uh, the amounts of or the proportion of exposure that they get uh, is quite equal, uh, and we see the same pattern in cumulative exposure. So over the whole lifespan of these children, um, for the kids living in Estonia, we see that the um, the magnitude of the Estonian. Uh, is not uh, that big anymore. Uh, but for Norwegian kids, again, it's, it's split right in the middle. Uh, yes, hang on. <laughs> Moving on to uh, exposure quality. So the richness scores, uh, which uh, are not uh, a proportion, uh, unlike the quality measures. Uh, we see this uh, quite expected mirrored image between um, children living in Norway, having quite a low score for Estonian richness and a much higher score for Norwegian richness. And uh, kids in Estonia having, you know, the mirrored uh, <laughs> uh, results with uh, very diverse Estonian in inputs and a less diverse Norwegian input. Uh, so um, quite, Expectedly, this uh, this does mirror the uh, environment that they live in, um, but still, it's um, it's an important point to to make it very clear that uh, the amount of exposure and the richness of exposure are not necessarily very uh, neatly linearly tied to each other. So you might have uh, less exposure, uh, or even in the case of uh, Norwegian sample you might have um, uh, roughly equal amounts of exposure, uh, but not uh, an equal quality of exposure. Uh, so uh, when speaking about the ties between quality and quantity, um, these are very preliminary results. They need more analysis, uh, but using conditional inference trees, um, some the first glance at, uh, at this data, shows the current exposure uh, is the most important predictor of the Estonian uh, richness scores. Uh, so all the kids that have over 63% of Estonian exposure uh, have a significantly higher richness score. And we see the exact same thing when we look at the Norwegian scores. Uh, again, uh, current Norwegian exposure uh, here, of course, the percentage is much lower because it mirrors the Estonian exposure. Uh, so anyone with over 37% of Norwegian exposure has then uh, a higher Norwegian richness score. Uh, when we look at quality across languages, uh, we see that Norwegian generally has uh, higher scores because most of their children do live in Norway. They get more diverse input. Uh, and we have uh, very, very loose clusters uh, of children who have rather low um, richness scores in both languages or rather high richness scores in both languages. 
Uh, and when we look at, uh, when we add Norwegian exposure measures to uh, the model explaining Estonian richness, uh, still current exposure uh, is uh, the strongest predictor for that. Uh, so uh, speaking about language competence and uh, exposure, uh, we see that uh, cumulative Estonian exposure uh, is a predictor that uh, is strongest for sentence repetition, uh, while for the vocabulary task, uh, it is Estonian richness score. Uh, and if we add Norwegian measures to the mix, uh, the significance doesn't uh, really change. Still, cumulative exposure is the thing that uh, affects sentence repetition most strongly, uh, while Estonian richness is still uh, the one that affects vocabulary uh, most significantly. So what we might conclude from this um, is that we see that the amount of current exposure uh, and the quality of current exposure or exposure in general uh, seem to be associated in both languages. Uh, and it does make sense because both of these are estimates of uh, the past year. Uh, however, when we look at the different competence measures, we see that vocabulary seems to be more strongly associated with language richness, so diversity and quality of the input, uh, whereas sentence repetition uh, seems to be associated with cumulative exposure, so the amount and also um, indirectly the length of time that they have spent in an Estonian environment. Uh, so, there might be, we might speculate on why that is exactly and what mechanisms underlie that. Um, uh, but what we can say uh, is that heritage Estonian exposure in Norway is um, maybe a bit surprisingly quite equal in quantity to their Norwegian exposure. Uh, and on the one hand, more diverse inputs in one language uh, is not associated with less diverse input in the other, um, but, um, but also having more um, diverse input doesn't always correlate with having more input. So since exposure quality and, and exposure quantity seem to be driving different language competences, uh, we can say that uh, having both a lot of exposure and diverse exposure is necessary for the language uh, development of the children. Um, but then again, as we see, the Estonian parents in Norway have managed to keep the exposure very equal. So it's uh, it's also a happy message to <laughs> send out to all parents raising their children that it is possible. Um, so yes, uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, both um, funding organizations and my um, dear student assistants who have helped with data collection and coding, and all the participating families that have made all of this possible. Uh, and this is it for me. I am very looking forward to your questions. Question. Thank you very much. I have a question. Oh, so this is self-reported data, right? Yeah, it's the exposure data, yes. That um, is self-reported. So I, how detailed was that? Mm. I, I would be hard yeah. to say how much time I've spent talking to my children yeah. in one language. Uh, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, so it's with parental reports and with self-reports, you, you always know that it's, it's an estimate, uh, but the the questionnaire. I have some some pictures or screenshots from it uh, here. Let's see. Uh, so the text is a bit small here, uh, but the the questionnaire that the parents saw. Uh, first, it could indicate like, okay, how many people do you have in your family? Like, uh, and yeah, what languages do you speak in your family? You could add more languages, but if you add two languages, so you have Estonian and Norwegian. And then they could use the slider to kind of estimates. Uh, and they did say, like, edit it together with them. And they, like, almost everyone was like, oh, this is so difficult. I don't know how to do this. 
but I do think that this, like, out of all the <laughs> options to do this, this is one of the more intuitive ways, um, because some questioners just ask to indicate, like, oh, what percentage of time do you speak this language to a child? And I think this is even more difficult, because we don't think of our language use in these terms. Uh, but this this seemed to be quite nice for an intuitive, because they could be like, oh, yeah, like, maybe then... Sometimes I say some words in Norwegian, so let's have like a little sliver <laughs> in there. Um, and then also we have this, um, uh, these like daily schedules for an average uh, week during school time and also um, the average weekend day uh, for holidays or weekends uh, where you just have to <laughs> indicate hour by hour like who is together with the child? Like, are they at school with friends and teachers or like outside school? And for family members, you just had each family member separately and you had to indicate like, okay, from seven to eight, they're with their dad and then I wake up and <laughs> and, and yeah, that's, that's how the scores um, came together. Thank you very much. We have three minutes to. <laughs> if you speak Estonian, <laughs> because if, if I'm yeah, it's in Estonian. Okay. Thank you. It's interesting. I speak Estonian. Sorry, I speak Estonian, but I'm going not going there. I'm exhausted to once you talk. <laughs> Yeah, we are also doing some work. Um, we have to finish this. Interesting. You said I was a good one. Yeah.